to the meeting of the Health Committee Public Online. I'd like to welcome all of our members who are participating by video conferencing this morning and also can I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. Mojin Moya is the Fatcher of the Lig, or Mojin Gala the Shaw, all on this nice morning. And I'm also going to start off there with apologies. No apologies received this morning. Are members aware of any other apologies? No. Okay, thank you, members. Um, moving on then to the draft minutes, members there, item three. I refer you to the draft minutes of, of the 11th of March at tab 3.1. Are members content with those minutes? Content, yeah. Thank you, members. And I can advise members that there are no matters arising. So, members, we're moving on then to our first substantive briefing this morning, which is a briefing on the, from Patricia Donnelly on the, an update into the vaccination programme. I refer members five of your pack, which include copies of recent correspondence received by the committee regarding vaccination. Also, members included in your table pack is a slide provided by the department. I can advise members of Patricia Donnelly from the Department of Health is here today to update the committee on the vaccination programme. And uh, members, we are expecting approximately 45 minutes for the session. So I would now like to welcome also by video link, Ms. Patricia Donnelly, who is head of COVID-19 vaccination programme. Good morning, Patricia. Are you able to hear us okay? Hi, Patricia, can you hear us okay? Um, we're not hearing you, Patricia. You're not you're not on mute, but I'm wondering, is it your headset? I can see you and I can see you speaking, but I'm not hearing you. No, we're still not picking up your audio, Patricia. It may be a setting on your side. No, still nothing. I'm not able to. And Patricia, just check your headset. There can be an on-off switch on the headset. There's also a volume button potentially, but we are we are seeing you clearly, but we're not we're not hearing from you at this minute. No. Okay, what I might need to suggest then, Patricia, is that we take a short pause to see if we can get, or if you can get some assistance on your end. The system here seems to be functioning this morning fine, but. I'll, I'll take a short break there, Patricia, and we just ask broadcasting. Well, yeah, we'll ask, I'll take some advice from Clark. Clark, it's usually better we stay on there, isn't it? Broadcasting can. Uh, I think we can pause broadcasting there just for a minute or two, and then we'll, we'll get access and uh, get back up and start it again. Okay, so please request a pause then, a suspension of broadcasting for a minute or two. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland. Thank you. So welcome, welcome back to Fonsha Arasharish members, and we do have that issue just now with Patricia. So once again, I welcome Miss Patricia Donnelly, who is head of COVID nineteen vaccination program. And um, Patricia, if you would like to just go ahead, please, and brief the committee on the latest update on the vaccination program. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much indeed. And apologies, not quite sure what happened. Um, thank you very much. I think I have a slide that you've previously seen that someone's going to display, and it's the programme plan, so I'll just okay. up update you on that. Well, if um, I can just ask then um, Broadcasting to bring Brandon into the spotlight, so Brandon, uh, activate that screen share function. So Broadcasting, can please bring Brandon up. And we'll just pause. I let you know when we are seeing the the uh, slide on our screens, Patricia. I'll give Thank you the you. indication there to resume. Thank you.
Okay, I see Branton is now in the spotlight. Branton, can you screen share the slides from Patricia, please? Thank you. Sorry, Chair, we're, I'm, I'm just trying to share my screen as well, but it doesn't seem to be, oh, that should be it now. Thank you, Brandon. Could you put that into presentation mode? Failing that, if you just increase the size, that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, that, that's fine. I think I can speak to that. Uh, members should have a copy of this in their pack and you will be familiar with this. This was the program plan for the COVID-19 vaccination and you will see from it that we had a number of phases um, and we've completed phase one, which is prior to group one and two, um, and phase two where we moved from the um, uh, down to the uh, through the age groups, uh, 75 to 79, 70 to 74, then the clinically extremely vulnerable and on down to carers and the at risk vulnerable group. And you will see uh, that we have virtually completed this uh, group and we have commenced priority groups uh, seven to nine. So as of um, Earlier this week, we uh, called out for the 70, the 50 to, to 59 year olds to come forward. And um, we've had a significant response to that. And uh, as of close of play on Tuesday, we had administered 704,000 uh, doses of vaccine, both of AstraZeneca and of Pfizer. And of these, 640,000 people had been vaccinated. We expect yesterday to have been another very busy day. And GPs had a lot of clinics running yesterday and uh, most of the vaccination centers continued to uh, operate. Um, you will see that our intention had been in the month of April that we'd go below the age of 50 to the, the remainder of the priority groups, which are 10 to 12. That runs in three groups um, from the 40 to 49 year olds, 30 to 39 and then 18 to 29. Um, and uh, later on a further uh, booster uh, vaccination program in the autumn or the winter. And I think if we can just look to the right of that screen, you'll see there's um, four main elements to our program. Um, uh, it was the seven vaccination centres that are currently operating. Yes, if you just scroll down, yes, the seven vaccination centres that are currently operating, they're very successful. There have been mobile teams that were going out to uh, care homes um, and they are they've all completed their work. The 321 general practices who are very actively um, operating at the moment and they've already delivered over 300,000 uh, doses to individuals and the small teams of district nurses and GPs who were going to new and temporary care home residents and to the housebound. And you will have heard of the mass vaccination center, which is at the SSE arena, that as the main vaccination centers were uh, fully preoccupied with uh, second doses, um, we opened this as a further opportunity to increase our capacity uh, during April and May, and also delighted to say that community pharmacy, I think that number is now 350 uh, community pharmacists that will also begin on the 29th of March, um, and they will be assisting us to work through the age cohorts, and uh, that will be the backbone of our winter program. If we take down the slide, um, that would be helpful. So. To date, uh, Chair and members, you'll see that our programme has been running very much uh, to time. Um, we're slightly ahead of our schedule. Each time a cohort starts to slow down in their booking, we open up another. Um, and we've had a steady vaccine supply that's enabled us to do that. Uh, we had an opportunity um, early in March with a very 
large bumper dose of AstraZeneca, which was a bonus that uh, I think wasn't on our original schedule. And we've deployed that out to GPs um, and to some of the vaccination centres. Um, the only restriction had been that this was short shelf life and needed to be used by the end of March, but plans were already well advanced for that to be done safely. Uh, and I'm happy to report that um, that is already underway. Uh, you will have heard from some national media that the second bumper dose that we were expecting at the end of March has now been delayed until April. Uh, we had not wholly counted on this as part of our plan. I think I indicated before that we're very try to be flexible about the way we deliver this. So by having a larger number of individuals, by having a group of um, both trusts using Pfizer largely, and then GPs and and uh, the new centers coming on board, um, that we would use AstraZeneca uh, and Pfizer in, in combination. Um, we have since in the last few days since we were aware that there'd be a change in the delivery schedule, we've adjusted our plans accordingly. So anyone who's already had a, uh, a booking, it will be honored. Anyone who's expecting a second dose, that will, uh, we have vaccine reserved for that. Um, but we're also hoping to continue with some first doses uh, during the month of April, as well as the remainder of March. Um, and we've been able to do this for a number of reasons. We have, first of all, um, uh, maintained three of the trusts continuing to use Pfizer because we've got a slightly improved delivery schedule for that. Uh, so we're not wholly relying on AstraZeneca. And we have um, scaled down slightly uh, the opening weeks in the SSE arena. Uh, the, it has the capacity for 40,000, but in in the first weeks, we're looking at 11,000, building up to 20, and then up to 30,000 in subsequent weeks. And uh, we've also met with the community pharmacy representatives to, to indicate to them what their uh, delivery schedule would be. And that will be going out to them next week for them to be able to book in individuals um, into local pharmacies. So we've tried to keep a very balanced approach to this. We've also been cautious about how we've approached the use of the vaccine and anticipated that where there were difficulties, we would very closely match the vaccine supply to the booking platform uh, so that we only would open up um, slots when we were able to have the vaccine to support them. So for anyone who hadn't already booked a slot, there will be some coming available. We're just asking them to be patient, Chair, uh, as we run through the next few weeks. So happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Patricia. <clears throat> and also just initially to, to acknowledge and uh, I think welcome the fact that the vaccination program has to date been extremely effective and it would appear very efficiently rolled out. Um, and I think we all welcome that. And I think the, the, the committee and the public welcome the fact that, the, that this vaccination is, is a key element of how we will move out of this pandemic and the crisis that it has engendered. But in terms of that cancellation of that order, which you referred to there, what what is what is your impact in terms of a delay to the overall program? What is the likely impact of that cancellation on the program that you were looking at yesterday or the day before that before that was announced? Well, I think worst case scenario, Chair, it probably puts us back by four weeks. Uh, the mitigation member. Um, measures that we put in place, we hope will only delay us by two weeks. So it, it won't have a huge impact. Um, we had hoped by the time we would launch the SSA arena that we would be opening to the over 40s. I think that will be um, maybe delayed by two weeks, but we'll keep that under review. Um, and it will very much depend on the remaining um, deliveries that we get from AstraZeneca. But as I said to you earlier, we have tried to find some mitigation through further use of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, so it, it will slightly delay it, but it won't, um, I think, reduce the, our, our plans overall. Okay, and how is that factoring then into the advice that the Head Department of Health and the Minister of Health is providing the executive in terms of easing of restrictions? And I mean, um, clearly, as we as we ease restrictions now, you then anticipate that you will have to address further problems that arise from that. Um, I met with the contact tracing team 
uh, a couple of days ago to to see how they were kind of match ready in the sense that they now come back into the the very critical spot right, that contact fine test trace isolating support needs to be functioning better now as we start to ease but in terms of the easing of restrictions what impact do you think that two to four week delay might have well, the minister has been very aware of these plans all along and been very aware that it is vaccine dependent. So the overall timings that we've been given to him haven't changed substantially. So I'm sure he's factored that into his advice. But I would think that would be very much a question for him uh, rather than for me, Chair. OK, thank you, Patricia. And then um, in relation to communications with the BAME communities, and we are aware, um, I think, that many of these workers who have come and have added to our economy very significantly over recent years, but many of whom may not have English as a first language, many of whom work in particularly vulnerable sectors such as meat plants, food processing, and indeed domiciliary care, where risk of risk of transmission is, is known to be greater. Also, many of whom may be working in houses of high, or living in high, houses of high multiple occupancy, and who may be further unnerved by all of the Brexit changes and things in terms of their status. So I think that's a particularly vulnerable group, particular difficulties around communicating with them and in terms of uptake of the vaccination. So can you outline for us what communication strategy or engagement strategy you, you have with those types of communities? Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Well, we're working very closely with public health um, agency colleagues, um, both analysing the uptake and looking at where we need to target the messaging. So where we become aware that there might be particular issues within a community, I think the standard approach is that you look at the messaging that would be appropriate to that group. Um, and uh, I'm very aware that some of the, the kind of national strategies that have worked very successfully have been around using senior leaders within that community that would influence the behaviour of others and also looking at uh, social media that would be targeted specifically at a, a an individual group. But we're very much at the beginning of that as we are getting uh, more information about the uptake to date and where we become aware of it, we've tried to develop campaigns on the back of that. Um, so it's it's not that there's a single straightforward answer to each one. I think it needs to be tailored for each of those communities. But you're quite right that it's very often um, the kind of fears, very specific fears, uh, potentially within an individual community that need to be addressed very directly. Some of them are health fears. Uh, some of them are around some of the um, adverse uh, um, I think information that would have been uh, available for those who have a very strong anti-vax views um, and I think that that can be very frightening to someone who's already a bit hesitant. So we're trying to tar target those very directly and use health experts where we can and, uh, and as I said use those senior leaders and influencers within the community. Thank you. And um, yeah, thank you, Patricia. We, we will, I suppose, keep an eye on that. But I do welcome the fact that that work has started because I think it is of, of critical importance. So thank you for that. And anything that we as, as political representatives can do to uh, assist with that engagement with those communities, I think we would all be very keen to do that um, because we're, we're, we're keen to support both you and those, those, those communities and those workers who are in very in, increased vulnerable frontline situations. So thank you for that. The final one for me then, Patricia, before I go to members for questions, is around the very, again, welcome news that the farm, community pharmacy are now um, being brought forward in terms of providing assistance to this. And I think you've said that has gone from 300 down to potentially 350 pharmacies. We are very aware within the committee the central role that community pharmacy has played throughout and indeed before and hopefully will play after this pandemic. So I think that's, that's to be welcomed, even just just the fact of bringing it to community level in that sense is a good a good development. But again, in relation to the delay in supply, how confident are you that we will have enough supply to make to get the maximum impact out of community pharmacies, skills, network, and experience? Well, uh, thank you, Chair, and Anna. We very much welcome your support for community pharmacy because you're right; it's it's that local accessibility which is going to influence the uptake. Uh, well, community pharmacy had already advised us that they wanted to have a slow beginning to build their confidence using these vaccines because they're somewhat different to that that they've experienced previously. So. Um, uh, the reduced vaccine supply plays into that slightly um, in that we are making vaccine available to 
every one of the pharmacies that have signed up for the program. And it means in the first few weeks, it won't be a huge amount of vaccine, but it'll be enough for them to gain experience, um, both in administering it in doing any observations after it and in being able to ensure they don't waste the vaccine. That's a been considerable concern to them because a punctured vial can only be um, uh, maintained for six hours and, and, the, and the vaccine has to be used. So ma them making sure that they're able to get enough people in in that time uh, to vaccinate, I think they'd felt some anxiety uh, about it, uh, uh, like others, treating this as a very precious commodity and not wanting to waste it. Um, so they've worked out and worked very well and closely with the department's teams and the digital team in using the vaccine management system. So I think their preparedness, um, I think, is is well underway and I think it means they will make a slower start but I expect that by the time we get to the higher volumes of vaccine available um, that they'll have a lot more confidence about managing the vaccine so it's very appropriate then that the higher volumes will come through at that point so I have uh, enormous confidence in this sector both been able to deliver now and into the future. Okay, and just before I do go to members then, um, what steps are being taken to counteract the delay that has been announced? Are you in active negotiations to try to replace that supply via other vaccines or via other, other producers? Um, are you actively seeking to head off that reduction in supply by, by other methods? Well, there are members of the team who are um, engaged um, several times a week um, with the with the UK. You will know that our vaccine is procured through Public Health England, and that we get our uh, two point eight five percent. Therefore. Um, it's very much down to um, what they're able to procure on our behalf. Uh, this the, this vaccine that is delayed was a bumper. Um, uh, delivery schedule that we hadn't expected. I mean, this came very late, this announcement that we would be getting this. So in some ways we hadn't counted on it. Um, we very much welcomed it. So uh, it's, it's um, it, while it's disappointing, it's not, uh, as I said, we're not, um, uh, our plans are not uh, offset too badly by it. Um, we have got increased amounts of Pfizer and, and, and I think that's been always very steady for us. Um, so that's enabled us to offset it in some way. So we're in constant communication around that. And uh, hopefully, you know, our steady supply that we've had up to date will continue through the month of March. We've no reason to believe it won't. Okay. Thank you, Patricia. And I will now go to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Patricia. Uh, once again, I, th I still think you're the most popular person in Northern Ireland, for sure. Um, I want to say well done, a fantastic rollout to date. Um, I think we're all very proud of that. So thank you and the entire team. And if you'd pass that on. Um, I, I wanted to ask in around um, the delay as well. It's good to hear that that, 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 um, that the delay in the AstraZeneca um, supplies won't have too great an impact and the chair had touched on um, other available vaccines as well uh, and I wanted to I wanted to ask you around that as well whether you're expecting any any new um, of the uh, booked vaccines to become available anytime soon if you've got any heads up on that and also I suppose when or when or if you do receive another bumper supply as you've described it um, I suppose you will still have the opportunity then, uh, especially when you have the facility of SSC on board, to really ramp up the the time. And I understand you, you've 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 toned that down for the initial weeks, but that really could ramp up greatly to up to forty thousand um, a week. And I presume that you're still keeping the option open of twenty four seven rollout if that would it would become possible um, in terms of supply. So if you could if you could answer me. Um, that one and I also want to ask around the um the pharmacy role in vaccination which is very welcome too. A lot of people would be very comfortable going to their own local pharmacies as well. I think that's very also very handy. But I presume that pharmacy will have a, a huge role in in kind of a, an annual or booster rollout in terms of, of future um winters and, and years just just as they do have a uh, a role in the flu vaccine rollout. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if I deal with the, them in the order you've, you've asked them, the other vaccines, we know that Moderna is already approved in, in by MHRA, um, but we haven't had any supplies of that yet. Uh, we get schedules that are suggesting it will be there sometime in late spring. We've got no exact information on that. It'd be very welcome if it comes, but um, we weren't relying on it. Um, uh, and as you say, and uh, I appreciate that you're recognising that the that additional dose of AstraZeneca that we're expecting is coming later in April. So it's not that it's disappeared completely off the schedule. So it does push things a little bit further back. I mean, the one advantage of the SSA arena is that we can run many lines in it. So you're able to operate quite a high rate um, on an hourly basis. Um, we're initially opening it for 12 hours a day. We, we can extend those hours if necessary. Um, but we have the capacity to ramp up significantly. And by the time I think the higher um, volumes of AstraZeneca is available, we will and should be able to get up to those uh, 40,000 a week, which you'll uh, understand is a, a significant number. But the other vaccination centres are still operating. Um, the only one that will stop for first doses is the one at the Ulster Hospital. As Southeastern Trust are running the SSA arena. So um, the others will still be operating first doses right through uh, April. So that is of great support to us um, as is the GP program. And of course, uh, pharmacy offers us a, a, a completely new opportunity. And as you say, very active this last winter in the flu program. And we expect that to be the, the case uh, uh, this winter coming. And the booster dose, we're waiting to hear what vaccine will be used which population will be targeted, if it's a single dose, when it should start. When we have all that information, which will come from the expert advisory group, the JCVI, uh, then we'll know the best way to uh, devise the programme for the winter. But I have no doubt community pharmacy will play a large part in that. And I think it's, it's very welcome, I, I think, by the public as well as by the programme. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and just finally from me, Patricia, um, can you tell us any more about uh, the the vaccine efforts in the special schools, whether that's complete or, and is there any prospect of further sectoral um, approach in the education sector in particular now that the plans are to get the kids all back into school? Uh, thank you very much. The, um, there's 696 special education staff who've been identified and named to us. The names were provided to the vaccination centres. And I understand um, as of yesterday or the day before that most of those are already booked on. So that was very welcome. Um, uh, the team at the Public Health Agency have done further work and it was looking at those children within the normal school sector, which would also fall into the same category of neurodisabilities where, where individuals um, uh, supporting them might uh, be better vaccinated and that work is underway so we've yet to hear a, a final outcome from that. Um, I suppose since we last met uh, with the committee JCVI has reported and uh, designated that the speediest way to vaccinate the, the community is to drop down in 10 year age um, sectors um, through the rest of the the, uh, the program. They will keep this under review. And if there is further advice about pulling forward an occupational group such as teaching or police or any other, um, we will immediately react to that. But as of yet, we've received no such guidance. That's super. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Patricia. And I'm going then, so I'm going then to Karen and Killen, then Jonathan, then Orlea, and then Paula. So go ahead, Carol, please. So thank you, Chair, and thank you, Patricia. Um, it's very encouraging to hear of the progress up until now. Patricia, I'd like to ask about, so I'm declared to interest I'm in the, the 55 to 59 category. Um, and I've been trying to break on for a vaccination and I can't do it in Belfast yet. So it's really just to say, is it definitely the 29th of March that the SS Arena will be opened and are there facilities to break on in advance of that? The other question that I would have is, you know, what is the staff complement needed to run the SS Arena? And then finally, just to continue the question that Pam had raised, and the second interest is I have family working in the education sector. Um, so the JCVI has 
kept under review the different sectors that should be vaccinated. Um, however, we have received a massive amount of correspondence in relation to certainly special educational needs schools, but also now this, the whole school uh, community. So it's re really just to try and indeed other frontline services. So it's just to try and get a response on those, Patricia, if you can, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, well, I'm disappointed you weren't able to get into the Belfast uh, Centre, but there are appointments available in other centres. Um, the SSA Arena will definitely open on the 29th and we expect to open the bookings next week. So uh, it's, it's uh, and at the same time, we work with Belfast and uh, several weeks at a time, we then open up the next set of bookings. So we're trying to do that, you'll understand, to manage vaccine supply. So once we're certain of a certain supply level, then we open up more appointments. So getting through the 50 to 59 year olds is a kind of rolling program of opening up appointments. Um, but what you should also be, be aware that GPs are also calling the 15, 50 to 59 year old. So you may find you get a call from your GP in advance of that. And if you do, I always advise people to take the earliest appointments you're offered and stick with it. Um, and uh, so you may find that you get it a bit quicker than you'd, than you'd uh, maybe expected. Um, I, I do feel, um, I, I do understand the anxieties that people both in schools and other sectors have when they, they look at uh, their own individual exposure and etc. But this expert advisory group have looked at the individual risks in this and they have based their advice on that. So um, in the programme, we react to that, we don't make that policy and therefore um, we just uh, um, observe that and wait for them to advise us which groups to, to vaccinate uh, um, first. Um, we will get to everyone as quickly as the vaccine is available and I would hope that uh, many teachers I think probably already have been vaccinated because of their age profile um, but for those others who are remaining I know it's an anxious time but it, it'll only be potentially a matter of weeks before we were able to drop down through the age ranges again and the final piece that you asked me is about the SSA arena well we're, we're remodeling the staffing now that we've ramped down our expectations we knew that we needed a, a large number of vaccinators to cover a 12-hour shift and we have a large we've I think over um, 700 people I think who've stepped forward and uh, potential as vaccinators for it now they'll be they'll they'll be um, uh, in shifts and they won't all be used in that first uh, period because we don't need them all in that first period um, what people don't aren't always aware it's not just vaccinators there's a lot of other people to support mm -hmm. so we did identify there was about 120 um, uh, admin staff that are needed and uh, we've welcomed those who've stepped forward to fill those roles um, um, because that's an important part of it you know coming in and getting booked in and and uh, getting yourself through through the system so it'll be a large busy team uh, both from car parking right through to vaccination and beyond. Patricia the, sorry Colm it's very quick the issue is a lot of people in Belfast, particularly those living in depraved communities, can't afford to travel to Fermanagh, Oma, Derry or Bully, uh, Mina. So, and we've all been advised not to ring our GPs, to let the GPs contact us. So I do think there is a job of work to do regarding communication about SS Arena, because I have, as a Belfast rep, uh, been receiving phone calls and if we could just, you know, you know, do something about the communication on that, that would be really greatly welcomed. Uh, well, we've tried very hard to have a, a, a good communication plan. We're usually releasing information every day. For example, when we realised the 60 to 64 year olds were a bit slower to come forward, we targeted some of that to try and try and push it. But GPs are locally based. They will be calling people and the um, local pharmacies will be available from the 29th of March. For the very reasons that you're stating, for those harder to reach, where it's less accessible, but um, but GPs are actively calling at the moment, and they're particularly, I think, picking out those that they believe are going to find it more difficult to access those um, those further afield. We will make sure we, we didn't want to, until we were absolutely certain of what the capacity would be in SSE, we didn't want to open up those slots. We could have opened them up this week, but I think we made a decision um, to open those early next week, but we'll keep that under review as we look at the demand for the other centres. Okay, thank you, Carol. Thanks, Patricia. So going then to Jonathan Buckley. Go ahead, Jonathan, please. 
Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Patricia. Uh, I have to say I'm extremely proud of the way in which the vaccination programme is rolling out in Northern Ireland. In the beginning, I said that I wanted to see Northern Ireland being a world leader in vaccine rollout, and it has lived up to every expectation that I could have had, along with the rest of the United Kingdom. So we're hugely proud of the work that you're doing and continuing to do. That contrasts starkly with the approach that the European Union have taken with regards to vaccine rollout, and in particular, uh, with relation to the vaccine nationalism surrounding the AstraZeneca vaccination. So I would just like to maybe get clarity from yourself. Has there been any issues with the AstraZeneca vaccination in Northern Ireland? And also on that exact point of AstraZeneca, how will the suspension of AstraZeneca rollout in the Irish Republic influence the pathway to recovery in Northern Ireland? And are you aware of what contact there has been between the CMO uh, in both jurisdictions uh, throughout this period? Thank you very much for your comments and the team very much appreciate this. It's a huge team effort across Northern Ireland. There are very many hundreds, indeed probably thousands of people involved in it. And uh, that's what it takes to have a successful programme, that kind of uh, commitment from all involved. We haven't had any issues with AstraZeneca. We have a yellow card system that any abnormal uh, or notifiable reactions to the vaccine is reported to MHRA. And so we're still acting under the approval of MHRA who remain confident that this is a safe vaccine. Um, and we would want the public to have that confidence uh, coming forward. Um, this is a, a virus that is of enormous threat to so many people and uh, vaccinating, uh, being vaccinated is certainly the first step towards that individual safety that is so importantly needed. Um, we don't yet know what the suspension of the programme, the impact it will have on us. And I think the matters of kind of policy, etc. for a CMO are really a matter for him rather than for me. Um, I'm not aware of what the contact is, but I'm sure there has been contact. And uh, we're, we're, we're pretty single-minded. The, the reason we've been successful today is we are single-minded in the programme. Uh, we just want to get it done. We want to, you know, identify any problems that there are, try and resolve them as we go along, try to make it a as um, free from bumps as possible, but inevitably there are some. And uh, I mean, the recent vaccine supply issues, the the, the recent issues um, and anxieties that have been around the vaccines uh, really don't deter us from trying to make sure that we just keep people's confidence in the programme and keep delivering it as effectively as possible. Okay, and thank you for that. And the comparable rate even between ourselves and the Republic of Ireland in relation to vaccine rollout is really is testimony to how single-minded approach that has been in terms of trying to get as much vaccination into the arms of the general public as possible. So we, we do thank you for that. Could, could you outline perhaps uh, what are the stocks available of Pfizer vaccine uh, and, and how these are being used? And finally, if I may, uh, GCVI have indicated the need for priority access for homeless people in relation to vaccination. This is something that should concern us all. Um, their ability to access even information about vaccination is low. Uh, could you please elaborate on how that is being implemented in Northern Ireland to ensure that those that are unfortunately homeless within Northern Ireland can have access to vaccination and also communication to ensure that they get vaccinated safely? Thank you very much. Um, indeed, there's a very successful winter flu vac vaccination program for the homeless. So we've worked with public health agency and colleagues within trust to identify individuals. Um, we were only ever going to use the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine with the homeless because we couldn't be sure about um, the dose interval for some of them. You needed to be able to be flexible. Um, I think some will be done through hostels. And again, I think they've got some uh, plans around those rough sleepers with, that aren't as easy to um, uh, deal with, but would uh, their locations are well known. And I think there's a, a program underway, partnership between public health agency and the trusts to deal with this highly vulnerable population. So we've been aware of it. We've plans in an advanced stage and expect that to be delivered um, at any point. In fact, probably some of the trusts have commenced that already, I would think. And to come to your second issue, which is around our Pfizer vaccine supply, um, um, we don't keep uh, 
big stocks of anything. When it comes in, we know what's coming in. Pfizer's been very reliable in the way that it's come in. When we know what's coming in, we allocate it immediately. Um, our original plan had been that we had a, a contract for 1.14 million doses of Pfizer vaccine. That would have been for first and second doses. Therefore, we always knew we needed to manage within that limitations. However, the um, contract was over a long period of, of time up to September. So what we've tried to do is um, then uh, use it very effectively in the first months of it and then slow down our use of it uh, as uh, to guarantee that we would have our second doses um, at the appropriate time. Um, what that's meant then is that we had a plan to migrate all of the trusts out of Pfizer into AstraZeneca is it was the vaccine that had the highest volume coming but we've slowed that down. Um, so only two trusts at this stage are using AstraZeneca and the rest uh, we're using Pfizer with and we'll continue with that while we've got, uh, we're, we're keeping that steady progress with our deliveries from Pfizer. So as I said, it's not that we keep a large stock, we don't, as soon as it, uh, we identify it coming in, we will only have enough to kind of turn over the stock and, uh, and release the rest uh, for immediate use. It comes in large packs, if you remember, of over a thousand doses a, a, a pack. So it's uh, easier to distribute and it's easier to identify, but it's not very flexible about how you use it. And it can only be used in these large centers. Okay, and, and thanks, Patricia. Thanks for your own personal accessibility as well throughout the program. I know I've emailed you personally and you've come back very efficiently and also uh, your ability to, to get out there and reach in the media as well. I watched a very interesting program of Talkback with a, an elderly lady who, who had no communication in relation to vaccination and for you to be able to give her the reassurance of trying to get somebody out there was, was certainly good to hear and I, I hope that there's as much uptake as possible so we can get to normality as quickly as possible. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. You and thanks, Patricia. Moving then to Orlea Flynn and then I will have Paula, Alan and Kara Hunter. So go back to our Orlea. Go ahead, Orlea, please. OK, thank you, Chair. And um, just similar to the other members, Patricia, I want to offer my your thanks to you and to all of the team um, for all of the tremendous work you have put into this vaccination programme. It is muchly appreciated. So thank you for that. Um, my first question, Patricia, is I'm not sure if We've had some feedback um, from some local surgeries in West Belfast and from some of our constituents around um, some vaccine shortages within certain GP practices. And I'm wondering, are you noticing any fluctuations with, with shortages among the GP practices? Um, that would be my first question. I know there's a vaccine timetable um, for the different practices. Are you, are you fighting any issues with that, um, Patricia? Um, well, there are always issues um, because up until we had that very large uh, delivery at the beginning of March, which was uh, now seems like a long time ago, but it isn't very long ago, um, we had steady but small supplies. So what that meant was it, there's 350 um, uh, GP surgeries across Northern Ireland. So to be very fair to all of them, uh, there was a the primary care team at the health board and members of the, the department's uh, vaccination team uh, um, really looked at what would be the fair way to distribute. So they looked at each practice and the age group we were vaccinating at the time and the size of the population within that practice. And then they allocated the vaccine on that basis. So they've tried to do that carefully. And that meant that sometimes that meant individuals got uh, a a, a pack now a pack could either be 80 doses or 100 doses we're not supplying vast amounts here but you can understand that for 350 practices you've already got rid of 35,000 doses so you can very quickly consume your vaccine supply so what we would try to do is make sure that we did it kind of carefully and that if you if you gave if someone had maybe 150 people within an age group and you're only able to give them 100 one week you try to address it the following week and that meant that not everybody got it in exactly the same way but they got it with the same principles which is uh, you know looking at what the demand would be within their practice and also since last week we're now aware 
that uh, some practices are coming up to second doses. So we needed to make sure that they had enough vaccine to do second doses. And that would mean that uh, a practice could look at a neighboring practice and think that someone was getting more, but it might just be to do with the profile and the age profile of that individual practice or how many clinically vulnerable people were within it and um, that we'd be aware of that we would try and match. So it, it, it's very frustrating for GPs, fully appreciate that, try to communicate with them as as well as we can. We work actively with the leaders within the, the, the profession and meet with them weekly, sometimes two and three times a week when we have to um, to talk through the strategy, to talk through um, the principles that we're operating on, to talk through the practices, to hear where things were difficult. So we know it feels a bit uneven. If we had more, of a, this is not the way you would do it if you had any other options, quite frankly. The easiest way to do it is to get all the vaccine in, stockpile it, and then divvy it up so that everybody is comfortable, they've got what they need, but we haven't been able to do that. And in fact, it's been more important to get people vaccinated. So it does mean it gets a bit uneven. We had hoped in the month of March, all of that would turn around. So although we've got a couple of bumper weeks here, we've got a, a couple more steady weeks ahead and then the vaccine, I think, hopefully will improve after that. No, and I appreciate that rationale, um, Patricia, the, the surgery in particular that I was speaking about was actually telling some constituents that there was going to be a three week gap until they received uh, more vaccine. But I have wrote off just individually around that case. But thank you. Thank you for that information. And just finally, Patricia, you mentioned earlier, so hopefully um, uh, come April, um, you might be able to do some first doses. And has the, the vaccination programme, have you predicted a sort of a, a ballpark figure on um, how many first doses you are trying to work towards, given the limitations possibly with the amount of vaccine? And is that going to be including in the over 40s? Uh, we had uh, modelling <laughs> done, which is on the basis of the vaccine that we had and we had expected. And we had hoped that, um, that we would have done a very high number. Um, we are at um, 740,000 individuals and um, over... Um, oh, sorry, 640, apologies, 640,000 individuals, over 704,000 doses. Um, we had hoped that that would be up over 700,000 by the end of March. Um, we'll keep an eye on that. If we can do that, we want to do it. Um, and it will very much depend on being able to manage the remainder of this um, vaccine stock that's coming in. Uh, our plan had been to get to the over 40s by the beginning of April. Uh, it will be later in April. I hope uh, at the very latest it will be at the end of April. But if we can bring it any time further forward, we certainly will. OK, Patricia, thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Thanks, Arlea. And going on to Paula Bradshaw. Go ahead, Paula, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Patricia, for coming this morning. I've got my first question is around those people who have been shielding the CEV group, and um, I just wonder um, if part of the um, the delay and some of them coming forward may be concerns around the vaccination centres. And, and can you so can you please confirm or otherwise whether there have been any outbreaks of community transmission linked to any of the vaccination centres? Thank you. Okay, uh, there's been absolutely no outbreaks in vaccination centres. Um, everyone in the vaccination centre has been vaccinated um, and they will already have had their second dose. Um, and we've had absolutely no incidents whatsoever within vaccination centres. And I do understand that for the, the clinically extremely vulnerable, it is difficult to to come out of shielding, um, to go to vaccination centres, but GPs are also calling them. And uh, so far, I mean, between those and the at-risk group, over 120,000 have been vaccinated. So some people are, are, are taking that, that courageous step for them uh, to come forward. I mean, they may want to find uh, or have more of their um, uh, their friends and colleagues and fellow citizens vaccinated before they feel completely safe, but we're getting there with that. Um, and uh, hopefully that will that will build their confidence. Thank you. And just moving on from that, at the last time you, uh, at the last health committee when you came, you mentioned that, that people who were shielding should have the two doses, then two weeks to build up immunity before they would return to work. Um, and I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth. Um, but those who have sh shielded they couldn't find the confirmation of that sort of advice anywhere. So I'm just wondering, is that the actual position? And if it is, then could you maybe convey that that should be put on NI Direct? 
Uh, can I can I clarify that it isn't my I think in answer to the question that I was asked at the time, I was saying that it, with immunity that you would expect you would only have immunity two weeks after, uh, so it was a separate question than the issue of CV. I think the advice is still for those who are CV to make those individual decisions about it to work at home where they can. So the advice is still around that uh, that care. Uh, that they need to take at an at an individual level and uh, to assess that but i didn't expect that uh, for for anyone to believe they would have full immunity until or the highest level of immunity until at least two weeks after their second dose so those are those are two separate uh, issues i'm sorry sorry i thought it was in re reply to a, a specific question that jerry had asked you about shielders um so just moving on then the final question um when the health minister was still was was last here he had mentioned that once once you got past priority group nine and then moving into 10 to 12 that there would be potential then for the vaccination centers the mass vaccination centers just to open up for everybody 49 and under are you then saying today that you would be given the supply issues that it would go down to 10, 11, 12, sort of in order of age groups as opposed to just mass opening. Thank you. Uh, yes, I think we will have to um, uh, go down um, to the, the 10, 11 and 12. I think we would need to do it. Um, those are very large groups. Um, so, in fact, you would you would it would be very frustrating for individuals, I think, to wait too long for their appointment. So if the vaccine supply um, uh, flows later in April and into May, then we will be able to open quite quickly um, one after the other. But uh, we're not just relying on the mass vaccination centre, but I said community pharmacy will be able to kind of supply through that. So it is more likely that we'll drop down, but uh, we'll keep looking at that because that's something we need to revise as we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. And Alan Chambers. Alan, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Patricia, I want to be associated with uh, all the remarks of uh, congratulations about the programme and how it has been working out. It's certainly been a wonderful example of, of teamwork. Um, in relation to uh, the pharmacy uh, community becoming involved uh, in the vaccination programme, and I certainly welcome that. That's another addition to the team. Um, how, how will you maybe flesh out how it will actually work from an admin point of view? Is it will patients be directed to a pharmacy by their GP, or it, will they simply walk into a pharmacy and fill in a form, and then their GP be informed? So, just how how, how will the admin of that be uh, be handled? Um, in terms of the uh, the, the, uh, we were delighted to hear about the military assistance that we were going to receive for our vaccinating program. Um, uh, are those military personnel being deployed currently, or uh, have they had to be sort of put back because of this, uh, this unfortunate delay in the arrival uh, of the vaccine? And my last question is, um, what what are the reasons? Uh, been given for the for the delay in the vaccine. Is it um, is it are there political uh, reasons involved, uh, or are there more practical reasons around maybe a breakdown in manufacturing or or whatever? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll just come through some of those. Um, community pharmacies are all going to operate maybe slightly differently, but the one thing that they will all use is the vaccine management system. So they will be able to put all the information about the individuals who book on with them and into the vaccine management system. So GPs will know who's been vaccinated in that way. We don't expect that GPs will refer, but they certainly can do if they want to. Um, I think people will be booking themselves. Um, I ha have heard that in some towns, practices are, uh, pharmacy practices are working together um, to deliver the program, which sounds to me eminently sensible, but uh, clearly they're all independent practices and therefore will make their own decisions about that. So they're working out how they'll do it. I think it's individuals indicate their interest and then they book a slot. I've emphasized before the importance of not wasting vaccine. So they won't open a vial until they know that they've got enough people spaced out, socially distanced uh, through the day uh, to kind of do that. So that's why I think that those first few weeks for them will be um, careful about how they're operating. They'll, they'll, they'll 
will uh, iron out all the kinks and gain confidence with that. So they may well change what how they do it um, after that time. Um, but uh, it does allow them a little bit of opportunity to kind of do that. But of great confidence, they will be able to do that. Um, and the second one um, about the military uh, being deployed. Yes, um, we expect within the SS arena, there'll be a number of military who'll be vaccinating there as part of the team. Uh, the original date for them to come in was, um, again, very much aligned to the start of the of the program uh, and we had an opportunity for them to come a little bit earlier but we declined that because now that with the with the um the uh, vaccine supply been a bit less we didn't need them any earlier than the beginning of the program so that is uh, uh, i think going to be an important part of the ss ss arena um uh, program and the third which was the reasons why the delay well that supply that the bumper both the one that we got at the beginning of um, march and the one we were expecting at the end of march would come came from india and uh the one that we got at the beginning of the march had a short shelf life of only two weeks which is unusual so we had to use it very quickly what we were expecting at the end of march was that another batch would also have a short shelf life um, a little bit longer than the first one so it was to the end of june um and we are now expecting that that will come in uh, April, we think these are technical difficulties rather than anything political, and that's what we've been led uh, to believe so far. But um, uh, I have no further information than that. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Alan, and thanks, uh, Patricia. I'm going finally to Cara Hunter, and I do want to thank you for Patricia. I know you've stayed a bit over the agreed time, but I appreciate you taking so many questions from members. So thanks for that. So go ahead, Cara, please. Thank you, Chair, and I will try and be brief as I'm aware of the time. Patricia, thank you again. Um, you're arguably the busiest woman in the country. <clears throat> so just to congratulate you on the good work that you're doing, thank you. Um, I just have a few questions. One of them is around public confidence. Um, I know Northern Ireland um, has a, a particular problem with uh, vaccine hesitancy and resistance. I'm just wondering, have you had any conversations with the health minister um, on tackling um, this and the kind of um, anti-vaxxers? Um, also, um, I, I saw recently uh, news reports around parents of clinically vulnerable children, uh, and I'm mindful um, that the vaccine was only tested uh, on adults, but um, for those parents out there, is there any considerations or updates um, for clinically vulnerable children under 16? Thank you. Okay, if I go to the vaccine hesitancy, uh, um, I mean, Northern Ireland, there will be a small number of people who are um, highly opposed to the vaccine, um, but a, a slightly greater number that are more hesitant and, and uh, anxious for themselves. Where we know that is, is true within a group, we try to get some um, good messages out to uh, give them confidence about about coming forward and the public health agency are leading on that so i do know this is of enormous interest to the minister and he will always always be um uh, asking us about what the plans are around this so as I said public health agency are targeting you'll see some of the kind of messages that are very clearly aimed at uh, younger women uh, aimed at those who are pregnant those who are um uh, concerned about fertility uh, etc so i think they will continue to refine those important communications um as we identify where the hesitancy exists so um uh, i think it has to be of concern i think to all of us as we're getting towards the the, the later stages of the program um and the other about the clinically extremely vulnerable children yes this is the um the um, AstraZeneca vaccine is only approved from 18 years and above. Pfizer is approved from 16 years and above. Um, so we've been able to vaccinate um, anyone in those age ranges. Um, for any of these vaccines down to 12 years of age, where there is an overriding um, concern that the paediatrician recommends it, I think it can then be used like any medication It can be used off label. And there's a small number where that's been the case, but it is not advised below that age. And I can understand, I, I think I've seen the same media report that you did and definitely felt for those parents in that case. Um, but what I am aware is that AstraZeneca has been doing further studies at the moment 
looking at uh, children and that we expect to get some kind of report from that by the summertime. And if we do and the advice changes, then we'll open it up for that. I don't think it's likely to be a, um, a in terms of a wider program, but maybe just targeted those clinically extremely vulnerable, which is what it is for the 16 to 17 year olds at the moment. That's great, Patricia. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patricia, just in relation to workforce, now I know there were issues at the start around people trying to uh, apply to become vaccinators to support that effort. Um, and I do know of cases where people have become so frustrated that they actually didn't complete the process. But I believe 506 people did complete the application process, of which 170 are now available. Can you tell us when the additional 336 people who have step forward to take part and to help this vaccination program would be brought into service? Uh, well, what we've what we've been told, I'm trying to look and see if I've got any kind of notes on this, uh, Chair. Um, I think those, they've been, uh, I, I, there's, a, the training course for them is now reduced to one day. So we know that that part of it is now quick, which was a slower part before. Um, and we also know that um, the uh, there has been a national protocol um, um, enacted that will allow us to look at final year medical and nursing students um, and looking at how they will come in to uh, support the vaccination program. Uh, it's really more by way of giving relief to those who are currently vaccinating rather, rather than saying we need additional vaccinators. We do to allow people to rotate in and out of that service. So um, I understood that they were all either lined up, many of those already lined up um, for the SSE arena and that's where the target had been. Some of those others were released back um, to trusts to use in their program. Um, I don't have the exact figures, but uh, I'll get those for you, um, Chair. Well, I'm just, uh, but I'm just, I'm just wondering if there are 336 people available now to start to go to the trust, to the arena, or whatever, when they are going to be brought and facilitated being brought into service, so we have them, those local well, feet on the ground. Yes, well, I, I think some of them are very definitely going to be part of the workforce of the SSA arena. I'll get the detailed information for you. I don't have it at hand now. Yes, please do. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, Patricia, listen, I want to wish you and all of your frontline team who are out there working so hard and so effectively in, in terms of, of this vaccine, to wish them all the best. They're, they're putting themselves in, in harm's way in a sense, and I think that's that's to be welcomed and appreciated. And uh, we, we want to wish you all the very best and that the, the, the program continues to deliver the high levels of, of effectiveness that we have seen to date. And thank you for coming to the committee this morning and all the best for now. Okay. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank you very much Bye. indeed. Okay, members, um, thank you. Anything uh, additional there to pick up on before um, I propose we'll take a very short break before our next session, but is there any comments or that members wish to? No, I think everyone okay in that sense. Okay, thank you. So it is now um, 10.34. Can we come back at, at 10.40, members, please, and for resumption at 10.40, just a short break. Thank you. Northern Ireland Assembly. Thank you, and thank you, members. So we're now resuming uh, our meeting this morning, and item six is a briefing from the Interim health champion, Mental Health Champion. I refer members there to the briefing paper, which is tab 6.1 of your pack, and to copies of the Mental Health Plan and Draft Mental Health Strategy at tab 6.2 and 6.3. So I'd now like to welcome Professor Siobhan O'Neill, who is the Interim Mental Health Champion. Good morning, Professor O'Neill. Are you able to hear us okay? I am all set, Colm. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. And thank Brilliant. you very much for having me here. Delighted. We're absolutely delighted. The committee has a particular concern around mental health. We have the whole impact of COVID obviously has an impact on mental health, but also has impacted our, our work in terms of the amount of work we had to do around COVID. But we have been aware of your, of your appointment and very uh, pleased about that and the work that you've been doing. So we're delighted to hear from you this morning. I also want to welcome with uh, Professor O'Neill, Mr. Peter Cash, who is Senior Policy and Research Officer in the Office of the Mental Health Champion. Peter, are you able to hear us okay? I am indeed, Chair. Thank you very much for your welcome. Okay, thank you. So listen, you're both very, very welcome this morning and 
Without uh, any further ado, I'd like to invite you now, Professor Neil, go to go ahead and brief our committee, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so in today's evidence, I'm going to be calling for the development of a trauma-informed recovery plan for Northern Ireland. Um, now, the, the phrases that I'm using and the terms trauma-informed, it's about recognising that whilst our well-being can be impacted by our normal emotional responses to what has happened over the past year, for most of us, the pandemic will not have caused trauma or mental illness. However, it recognises also that there are several population groups that have been disproportionately affected and have suffered very real trauma, which comes on the top of previous trauma. And it's these groups that we actually need to target in our preventative interventions and treatments if treatments are necessary. So a trauma-informed approach is completely different from our traditional model of mental illness, um, which was about really defining what's wrong with us and treating the, the symptoms of, of illness. So it's recognizing that our well-being and mental health results from our responses to things that have happened to us. So that's that's a differentiation I want you to, to try and grasp if you can. So, so why do we need a trauma-informed recovery plan? Um, so on the one hand, we've got stress. So trauma is on this continuum with stress. And stress is not usually harmful um, and the pandemic has caused lots of stress so trauma is an experience that causes distress because it threatens our life or our personal integrity and overwhelms our ability to cope and causes those feelings of helplessness so that that's really the, the trauma that i'm talking about um, and the effect of, of that trauma or even chronic stress where we're living in an intensely stressful situation is the, the biological dysregulation. And you'll be familiar with the fight, flight, or freeze response. It's our body's reaction, it's inbuilt within us. Um, and the goal of the trauma-informed approaches then is to promote regulation of that, emotional regulation of that biological dysregulation that happens with stress and trauma. Now, with normal stress, it happens and it goes away again. But with chronic stress, we can get stuck up there in a state of dysregulation. And that is the basis of of mental health and mental illness. So trauma-informed practice prioritizes our physical safety and also our psychological safety, because if we don't feel safe, then we will become dysregulated. It's a source of stress for us. So this is as much about making sure that we don't have any more waves of the, the virus as anything else, so that we feel physically safe and then psychologically we feel safe and secure. So the approach that I'm talking about um, also recognizes community neuroscience, this idea that as humans, we've evolved to live in social groups. And there are literally parts of our brain that are activated in tandem with the brains of our loved ones. And there are mirror neurons that, that help us connect with other people and make us feel safe and secure. So the healing from trauma occurs through our attachments to others and families and communities. And psychological safety is promoted through relationships. Relationships. So as you can see there, I'm not talking about applying treatments for an illness. I'm talking about healing through relationships and connection. So in trauma-informed practice, there's no us and them. There's only us because we're part of this whole community of humans and we all suffer because other people have suffered and we heal through our relationships with others. So aspects of trauma-informed approaches would include trustworthiness, transparency, collaboration, real partnerships with service users, equality, empowerment and respect and all of those things. So it removes that hierarchy um, and it means looking after our healthcare providers equally alongside those people that we we need to help and support who have mental health difficulties. So trauma-informed approaches also recognize inequality, the trauma of inequality and discrimination and cultural, historic, gender-related trauma. So in Northern Ireland, this also refers to how we address and discuss issues associated with the conflict, recognizing that there are communities and individuals who live in continuing fear and threat and we, we need to be very careful not to re-traumatize those individuals through our language, through the way that we address um, our, our historic past. So what is the research telling us about the pandemic? Um, so very clearly, the majority of us are not at risk of mental illness. Um, and this is what we would have expected because most people, even when terrible things happen, very distressing things, we don't develop mental illness. Healing occurs, we cope, we have evolved to be very, very resilient. So phrases like the tsunami of mental illness 
that those sorts of phrases are not appropriate because healing and recovery and even growth are likely if we manage recovery very well. The, the studies show us that particular population groups are at higher risk of having adverse mental health impacts through ongoing dysregulation that's resulting from stress and trauma. And in line with what we know about trauma, these are the groups who are the powerless groups traditionally, who have been carrying the burden of multiple roles and who have a history of trauma and discrimination. They are children, young people, women, people with children at home, and people with existing mental or physical illness, people on very low incomes and unpaid carers. There's also a mental health risk that comes from the COVID infection itself. So COVID is associated with a higher risk of mental illness, particularly among people with severe infection, those people with long COVID and people who were hospitalized. And again, that might constitute a trauma for those individuals. We're seeing really high rates of distress and even post-traumatic stress disorder in health and social care workers. Um, and women, again, have a higher risk than men. And the Maternal Mental Health Alliance are concerned about the effects of the stress of the pandemic and the restrictions in hospital visits and, and those women that have given birth during the pandemic being at higher risk of postnatal depression. And of course, in keeping with the trauma-informed approach, that's going to impact their relationships with their children. So there's another generation that we need to support by supporting our mothers there too. So turning first to children and young people, uh, the most recent report from the CoSpace study, and that's a study of the UK and Ireland and Northern Ireland and several European countries too, and the, the February 2021 reports are showing that a third of primary school children, uh, primary school age boys, and a quarter of primary school age girls have problems with hyperactivity or inattention. Again, this reflects that emotional, that, that dysregulation, the impact of the stress of being separated from their people years and for not having the, their uh, structures of the school day. In January, the, the figures showed that 30.8% of secondary school age girls reported emotional problems, and that was compared with 15.6% of boys. And those rates were at the highest rates since last March. So if we can imagine, most of us were, were on high alert naturally and normally last March, but for most people that's gone away down. But, but our secondary school age girls are right back up there where they were last March, and that is really, really worrying. There's another review of 27 studies looking at school closures specifically, and the academics involved in that review said that they were associated with considerable harm to health and well-being. There's been a decrease in hospital presentations and even delayed presentations with uh, children and young people presenting more seriously ill. So, for example, dangerously underweight as a result of restricting their eating. Again, that's, that's a behaviour that people engage in, in in order to try and control the emotional impact of the stress that they're experiencing in order to try and regulate that. There's also concerning increases in screen time and a reduction in physical activity. So physical activity is regulating and, and young people are doing less of that. All the studies show that young people in deprived areas and children with special educational needs were at greater risk. Now, we know that children in Northern Ireland have higher rates of mental health problems than in other areas. So it's really important that we now protect our children and young people from any possible further harm. So turning to suicide prevention, um, there's generally no increase in suicide rates in the Western world. And our surveillance of probable suicides indicates that there's been no rise in Northern Ireland either. Um, nonetheless, a UK-wide study found that there was an increase in the rates of suicidal thoughts as the pandemic progressed, so that's getting worse. And suicidal thoughts, again, keeping with the trends, they're highest in the youngest age groups, in the 18 to 29 age group in that survey, 12.5% had suicidal thoughts, and it goes right down to 1.9% in the over 60s, 8.4% in, in that 30 to 59 um, group. So suicides related to mental illness, but again, a trauma-informed approach is actually much more appropriate because it recognises the role of life events and overwhelming distress, and this changes how we, we treat suicidal thoughts. Trauma-informed treatments emphasise relationships, connection, compassion, but also safety planning and problem solving and treating those mental illnesses if they're there and looking at all of the aspects of that person's life that that led them to that to that point. 
Again, people in the lower socioeconomic groups and people with existing mental illness were more likely to have those suicidal thoughts. Um, as, as I said, the, the rates of suicidal thoughts increased as the, as the pandemic progressed. And the latest data from the, the last part of last year shows that defeat entrapment are starting to increase again. And that's with lockdown um, and people are worried about their futures and particularly in young people, people in lower social and economic groups, women and those with pre-existing mental illness. So my recommendations. Um, so what I'm saying is that healing from trauma is achieved through connections and communities and relationships and reconnecting, particularly for the groups who were most affected. That should be the primary goal of the recovery plan. Um, the cross departmental approach to mental health recovery is required because many of the determinants of mental health health under that trauma informed approach, you know, we need that secure base. So housing, employment, debt, social relationships, those are all outside of really outside of the remit of the Department of Health. So all of the government departments need to step up here. There are universal interventions that are going to impact on suicide rates and mental health um, and those include the financial safety nets and the support for people who have lost income and employment. There's also important public health responses that we need to prioritize around domestic violence, the safe consumption of alcohol, support for people who are facing isolation and entrapment, support for those who are lonely and support for those who are bereaved. A full, safe return to school is important, emphasizing safe for pupils and teachers. If you don't feel safe, you can't co-regulate others. And the emphasis should be on reconnection and regulation through play, art, music, <laughs> not exams or um, exam preparation, because that, again, heightens that stress response and moves away from what we're trying to achieve here. The summer period should also be used for community-based programs promoting well-being and reconnection and regulation. For the general population, we need to emphasize the resilience that has been shown. A narrative which states that we're all going to have mental illness is actually really disempowering, inaccurate and potentially harmful. So we must continue to promote the importance of self-care using the evidence-based Take 5 steps and the support available locally. So that's our campaigns. Um, and emphasize the importance of connection. And I think physical activity is two very simple things which will make a huge difference to the healing process. I would also say we need to promote the, the value of good food, sleep and exercise. Getting all those physical things right will, will put us in a better position to heal psychologically. So funding does need to be made available to increase the capacity of mental health services to provide treatments for depression and anxiety for those who need them. Um, so people will tip over into those thresholds for mental illness. It's really important that we provide treatments. The crisis intervention services need to be improved very, very urgently so that people who are suicidal have compassionate support and interventions for safety planning and problem solving. And there shouldn't be waiting times, but it's about that continuous support, almost like with, within the, the next 48 hours after someone feels suicidal. It's vital that we look after our healthcare staff, of course, and that needs to include informal and unpaid carers because they're part of the workforce and we need to support them in the same way that we support all our other healthcare providers. There needs to be compassionate outreach to those groups who have experienced higher levels of trauma and loss. Not, not necessarily applying treatments, but we need to let them know that we are there for them and ready to respond if they develop symptoms or illnesses or if they feel that they can't cope. And this includes what health and social care workers and people working in funeral services and people working in care homes. We also need outreach to people who've been hospitalized due to the COVID virus, um, people with symptoms of long COVID and people who have been pregnant or given birth at the time of the pandemic. The budget for mental health services needs to be increased commensurate with the increased rates of pre-pandemic mental illness and the evidence of more severe and chronic mental illness. And then we need to add on our 20% at least um, the increase that we're expecting resulting from the pandemic. 
when we're expanding mental health services, we really need to address the inequalities in the provision and access for, for LGBT people, for people from BME, BAME groups, for older people, and people at risk of abuse and violence. Because again, those are the groups that are powerless, at higher risk, and have problems accessing services. We need to make plans now for a programme of events and actions to memorialise and remember those we have lost to COVID, particularly where that loss has been disproportionate, such as in care homes. So bereavement and grief cause distress, but the healing is not through mental, mental illness treatments. The healing is through connection, memorialising and supporting people through that grief process. Finally, you'll be glad to know, it's important to note that these transitions that we're seeing right now is sort of po moving into the post-pandemic time um, and we're trying to reconnect and that may actually increase anxiety for people too. Um, and there's a stigma around that as well, but we need to acknowledge that and empower people to adjust in a spirit of hope. The support should be provided for organisations like schools and health and care services and businesses to adopt, tra adopt trauma-informed approaches to engender a sense of psychological safety as we approach the end of lockdown. So I would be delighted to take your questions now on that. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. Okay, thank you, Siobhan. And I have to say, well, I suppose just from the outset, I should actually declare my own interest in terms of having worked as a social worker um, and indeed worked in, in family and, and in community, at a community level, but also having had the benefit of some of the training around the whole trauma-informed approach. And I think that's an excellent model to use. And there's so much, like, not only, not only was it a fantastic presentation, I have to say, but I think a really, really important presentation for all of our, our political institutions, for the executive, that whole idea about having to deal with these inequalities, not simply because they're a problem in themselves, but because they also feed out into difficulties throughout our whole society. So, you know, dealing with inequalities will also help your economy, if you want to even just look at it as, you know, so you're dealing with economic inactivity, you're dealing with that community type of response, so I think it's really interesting. I, I also had a particular interest when I, when I was working in social work around that area of um, transgenerational trauma. And you touched upon that in relation to the next generation. But also we're still, and we need to recognise, we're still carrying some of the transgenerational trauma from the conflict into, into what's happening now. And I think that's, that's vital that, that, that that's recognised. And I think that approach would be a game changer in the sense of, a more holistic approach to mental health generally. It struck me just in general terms as well, in terms of the people who are more um, vulnerable to mental ill health um, are largely unpaid cures, those on lower incomes are less well off, in eating disorder and in terms of hyperactivity. And it struck me throughout that how many of those areas are also predominantly women. And I think that's something that, that we need to really get to grips with. And I am aware, I became aware recently, that actually girls uh, struggle to get a diagnosis as quickly as boys because sometimes their behaviours don't show up in a way that, that draw attention to them. And that's, that's, that's another issue. So I think, I think those, are, those are really useful ways to look at it. I think this is going to have to be a cross-departmental, a whole society approach to dealing with all of this. And I, I very much welcome the fact that, that you have highlighted that as a, as a way forward. Just a couple of questions specifically from me and then of one of the members. I'm, cur I'm keen to know sort of what level of communication you have with the department in relation to mental health regulations, which we in committee here deal with on a, a, throughout the pandemic, specific regulations to do with and one of those has been looking at a particular regulation that extends the period of time which must elapse for a second opinion to be required for the continued administration of medicines to detain patients, and that went from three to six months. Now, we had expressed some concern as a committee in relation to that, and indeed we do very much welcome the fact that the Minister has now written indicating that he's reversing that amendment, but we have we have highlighted with the department that we would be keen that they would consult with the leg of yourselves, with the leg of the Human Rights Commission, when considering those regulations. So I just want to I just want to check with you what sort of level of, of contact you would have in relation to drafting or formulating these types of regs, regulations. 
Um, yeah, it's a good question, Colm. The department wrote to me when they were considering changing those regulations and asked me to, to review what they were proposing. And we provided a response to that and felt, of course, you know, it's it's disappointing that these things have to happen. But um, broadly, you know, we, we felt that it was probably necessary and supported the department in relation to that. But um, they, they do write to us and those sorts of issues. Okay. Thank you. And then in relation to the good summer well-being, and I recognise much of what you're saying around children, I think we all do share your concern around children, yeah. the impact of this pandemic, on top of all the other things they were struggling with, and the need to allow children to be children, just at times I'd, I'd try to proactively repair some of the damage that has doubtless been caused you know, through the summer months when, when, the, when the opportunity might allow. So I'm wondering um, how that's planned on being rolled out, that Good Summer Wellbeing Programme. Is it, will it be down to community level? Because I think that also feeds into building the ability and resilience of community groups to deal with some of these issues if they're involved in that. So can you tell us a little more about that, please? Absolutely. There's there's a range of uh, community groups who are already providing and planning their activities right now. So we're trying to connect those up to make sure that they're properly supported. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're working with the public health agency to um, develop a program that will be available to all children and young people in Northern Ireland. So we have like plan A, plan B, plan C, depending on where we are in terms of the restrictions as well. But I would be very hopeful at this stage that there would be something for every child in Northern Ireland, albeit um, it, it might end up having to be virtual if we if we don't have a full reopening there and we can't do face-to-face um Face to face provision, but but we're working. We've we've had um, very positive responses actually from all of the departments. I feel quite strongly that it needs to be away from the educational setting because the temptation will always be there to focus on the schoolwork um, and where children are in relation to their schoolwork. And once we need to reassure children and young people because they're worried about this too. We we you know we need to face this down and say well you know we need to make make them aware of the fact that we're going to address that, but we need to give them some time out um, and we all know what, what, what the benefit of time off is and a real break we need to give children a real break this summer um, to play to regulate to do all those things and adults too need to do this art music culture dance drama sport also important to um to help to improve our mental health to improve our well-being yeah thank you Okay, and um, finally for me then, in relation to my own previous experience, um, I was often struck by how many of the cases we were dealing with that had what, what, what we're doing is that, that triangle of, of trauma where you had within, within a family addictions, potentially domestic violence, and I welcome the fact, and I think we all do, that we're trying to do better on the, on the domestic violence, coercion, and all of that, and abuse. Um, and I think... I think the trauma informed approach to that, you know, it's 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 a crucial element of the trauma impact. The fact that repeated traumas have a, a kind of a, a the, the build up, the, the whole the whole plasticity of the brain, especially young brains and the cortisol and the, the hormones that are released, even in potentially low enough levels of tension. But if that's repeated, then that starts to form patterns. So are there any plans to kind of roll out that awareness, at least in the form? instance of the impact of trauma and how frontline professionals beyond health may be able to recognize a deal and support, you know address issues and support children in a trauma is that part of your planning at this stage um yeah yeah we were all familiar with that sort of perception of walking on eggshells and how enormously stressful that can be in the long term um and we pick up subtle cues when our when the people who are around us are stressed or under pressure when things are not quite right you know so you're you're right it's about that underlying stuff as well as the more overt externalizing behaviors that you know hurt people hurt people like that that's the ad- adage that that applies to this so what what i'm doing through through another project called Our Generation, and this is a European funded project through the university, is rolling out um, trauma informed interventions for children and young people in deprived and border areas. And we've got training then that will be rolling out on a more broad basis. The Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland are rolling out uh, trauma informed practice training as well. Um, and there's also the MACE project, which has been successfully delivering training in trauma informed practice. There's so much actually available free 
on YouTube if anybody wants to start Googling this, you know, um, but it really is a game changer. So the work of Karen Treisman, uh, Gabor Mate, you know, th- those those are the key people that, that you can get some really good talks. The um, Action Trauma do a, a trauma conference, a trauma summit every year. And again, some of that material is available online for free for everybody to have a little look at. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So listen, I'm going to go across now to members. I'm going to go first of all to our Leah Flynn, then Pam Cameron, Jerry Carroll, Carol McKillen, Dara Hunter, and Paula Bradshaw. That's the order I have there at present. So I'll go first of all to you or Leah. Go ahead, please. Um, thank you, Colin, and thank Siobhan for um, your presentation today. Um, I know that we met last week and um, we've probably covered everything that, that, that I've wanted to cover with you already at this stage, but um, I appreciate you coming to today's committee and, and that was a really interesting um, overview there around that trauma-informed approach. So just maybe to focus on that then, um, the so the obviously that's going to take um, intervention and, and commitment from across all the departments, as you said, but how, how will this recovery plan I suppose interlink with the mental health action plan where the Department of Health, so with the Department of Health specifically and what their remit and roles and responsibilities are to deal with the, the mental health um, problems in our society, how will that trauma informed recovery plan interlink with the mental health action plan? And I would be interested to know, I know that there has been some, there has been some investment in the COVID-19 section of that action plan around um, the psychological talk and therapy some additional nurses but in your opinion do you think that that's enough and what would be the what would be the the key the sort of two or three key priorities for you at the moment that from a departmental um health perspective that we need to invest in for for mental health thank you okay thank you you earlier great questions again um and so how, how will the action plan fit within the trauma-informed recovery plan? Well, the action plan uh, is around mental health services and the messages, I think, that we've sent out around mental health and also about suicide prevention. So the action plan is about helping those people who are meeting the threshold for mental illness, basically meeting the... So, so they, they've had trauma, distress, but but their symptoms are ongoing. So the period of time, that the, the nature of the symptoms determines whether or not someone's eligible for a treatment or whether somebody needs a treatment. And if you try and apply treatments where people don't need them, you actually create more distress because you're telling someone they're, they're on their own way you know so th- that that's very important so this is not really about counseling upon request or counseling upon demand and and actually those reconnections within families and communities are healing and they promote resilience and they can even promote post-traumatic growth you know but where someone has a mental illness that can be diagnosed there it's about making sure that they get prompt treatment so the right treatment at the right time um, and that's where the the mental health strategy is really really strong so there's early intervention we tackle the symptoms we teach people how to self-manage and how how to take control over their well-being and that's so empowering and important we teach people about the importance of those relationships that we have with our children particularly but across communities but then when someone has has a mental illness we give them the treatments that the evidence tells us will will really work so the mental health strategy is the plan to deliver all of those treatments the two priorities and you asked for key priorities um i think one is crisis intervention um, and crisis intervention is about recognizing that people are in a state of distress uh, that you know they might become suicidal and it's providing compassionate support straight away there and continuous support so I know the crisis intervention services are being reviewed right now that review should be reporting very very soon and then we should be we should be prioritizing turning around those services now there are great services that exist at the minute so it's probably Probably going to be about building on those services, but the importance is that it's it's continuous, that it's not just a one-off intervention, that we do these safety plan and interventions uh, with people who are suicidal. So you'll have seen maybe the documentaries on over the past couple of days um, about you know when someone gets very suicidal, the thoughts can can come really really strong, and then they can you know 
reduce a bit. So it's helping people manage those thoughts and problem solve and work out ways of changing their lives so that they don't feel suicidal anymore. So crisis intervention services for me are a priority. Dual diagnosis services, and we spoke about this on the radio yesterday early as well. You know, people um, who are using substances, again, under a trauma-informed um approach we would be saying that this is a natural way that we have of coping with stress you know this could be any one of us but whenever we're distressed we can become dependent on substances but it's about recognizing that there are underlying traumas maybe even underlying mental illnesses and they all come together and we need to be able to provide a service that helps people manage and navigate all of those so we're not trying to box people off into either addiction or mental health but we have something that's provided um, to address both so those are key uh, priorities i think eating disorders too give Given that figure, one in six young people here are, are engaging in disordered eating, um, again, as a way of controlling their emotional response to, to trauma, stress, pressure, chronic anxiety, whatever it is, a way of controlling things, but it's a really dangerous pattern. So those eating disorder services, getting in there earlier would be a priority for me. But you know, if you look through the list of actions in the mental health strategy, there's very little there that, that isn't a priority. So it's about, you know, just the, it's thinking about, well, where are we losing people? People, and that's what the crisis intervention services and dual diagnosis where there are people actually dying, you know, so that's huge. Yeah, thank you. And I fully agree um, with, with, with those priorities and those comments, Siobhan. And I think that, you know, even the role that you've taken up as the mental health champion, you know, even the fact that you did have the opportunity to take part in, in that interview yesterday around a family who's been bereaved as a result of um, a young man that was battling with addiction and mental health. So I think for that, I'm hoping that your role is a comfort to families out there who are struggling with these really difficult issues. Um, and maybe just to finish then, um, Siobhan, you had mentioned then some of the at-risk groups. And, you know, we hear time and time again about, you know, the issue around health inequalities, areas of deprivation, people that are obviously falling within that lower socioeconomic um, group. And um, I'm just wondering then in terms of the budget, because we do know and we have raised this with the minister that the, the, the percentage share of the budget does need to be increased for, for mental health. Um, so would you agree that the it may be a sensible approach to try and, you know, almost ring fence or target some of that funding towards those at risk groups? And the final point was the issue around the psychological helplines for health and social care staff, because I know that they fall into that bracket. Um, we did get feedback from Charlotte McCardell, the Chief Nursing Officer, that there hasn't been a great uptake um, on those those helplines and just maybe your, your view on that. And that's everything for me. Thanks very much. OK, well, well, I need to make notes for everything. Are you sorry? Because <laughs> I forget parts of sentences. Um, so, yeah, funding for at risk groups, allocating funding. Um, yeah, there, there is merit in that in that argument, certainly. But we can't forget the early intervention and prevention, too. Um, and again, it's there, there are universal things that we can do that mightn't cost a lot of money, like our summer programs that will actually lift everybody, you know, and as long as we make sure that they're accessible to the address groups, then, you know, that that's that's good as well. But but certainly there's an argument there for actually ring fencing funding for those address groups. Um, and prioritizing that. But, you know, the 10-year the, the strategy is required because we need to see how that fits within an overall plan. The last thing you want to do is start to develop a service and then find you have to change it again and that's going to cost you more. So that that's really why, and this is a really hard part of my job is trying to explain to bereaved people, to people who are on waiting lists, why it's 10 years, why we can't just do it straight away, you know, but we need to move really quickly. We, we, we do, and I know the minister has committed to turning around the final version of the strategy straight away so that we can we can get moving. Um, so it's going to be a few weeks yet before we start to see the actions in the final version. Um, and that's no comfort to the bereaved, you know, and that's that's where we are, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Aaliyah. Is that, is that it, Aaliyah, there for you? Yeah, it was just a wee point on the psychological helpline, Siobhan, about the health. Oh, for God, I totally for um, yeah. yeah, I mean, and that's why the compassionate outreach is, is so important. So we need to find out, but why is that happening? We know people are struggling and suffering. So 
what is it you know and, and again we know this, the, the the need is there but the other thing is we shouldn't be pushing help on people because people do recover and they're more empowered when they do that and they feel stronger you know so it's not about giving people treatment that they don't need the other thing we could do very clearly is extend the um the remit for for those helplines to unpaid carers we know they're suffering and we sent a letter to that effect so that we could try and and have carers access those services because there are many carers who do want and need services straight away but but you know we need to be providing the respite care there and supporting them so that they don't develop mental health problems you know it's not just about providing treatments when somebody gets ill so i don't want a prevention and intervention to be forgotten here because it's much much cheaper to provide respite and to pro- provide that recognition of carers as part of the health service which, which they really are but they don't feel like that at the minute you know they, they've been largely forgotten about um in this pandemic and that's not good enough Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, Arlea, and thank you, Pam. So go on then, go on into our deputy chair, Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, Professor O'Neill. I really do appreciate your attendance at the committee, and thank you for a very detailed briefing um, this morning. And the the twenty recommendations obviously will will pose a challenge to both the health department and to all the departments across. The board and i think that's um appropriate um also want to thank you as well for for raising that issue around the language that we use i think it's really important something i hadn't fully um uh, appreciated the fact that you know it's um when we all have mental health but we don't all have mental illness so we need to um be careful that we are not kind of throwing words around us that they're they're actually causing more distress and, and more fear as well, so um, thank you for that. Um, my questions, um, Siobhan, uh, recommendation 20 proposes that the trauma-centred approaches should be at the heart of schools, health services, businesses moving forward. How can we take that work forward in a, in a practical way in order to ingrain this um, culture within those organisations? That's my first question, then I have another one. Mm-hmm. Okay, one question at a time was great. Thanks, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> that suits me very well. <laughs> Um, so, so how do we do that? Well, well, we we just encourage employers. Um, we we raise awareness, I think, of the importance of psychological safety and of real safety. So we we need to again make sure that employers are aware of what restrictions are in place at, at any particular time, and that they're protecting their staff. So staff feel that if they need to come into work on a face to face basis, that they are safe. Um, that flexibility that employers have shown the whole way through the pandemic has been brilliant. So we need to see how we can continue with that particularly again for those groups um people with children at home women people who are carers all of those groups so we offer them that flexibility and that sort of compassion just saying you know i know it's been a, it's been a hard year so we're going to take this easy um and we're going to support you and we're going to listen to what you want um it's also about employers looking after their own mental health and well-being as well so that they're well regulated and they're in a position to really see and understand what the needs of their staff are um as as we re-emerge for this and that transparency is so important that that principle of transparency where you give people information so there'll be a lot of companies and staff now who are thinking my job's at risk i want to know where we are in terms of profits and how we're going to cope after furlough ends and all of that stuff so that transparency and information sharing is absolutely crucial but you know a well-regulated boss can then come in and problem solve with staff and help work work out how we can meet everybody's needs there so those are the key messages it's actually quite simple but um those hierarchical structures where we don't treat people well or where we don't listen to what people need that that can be very um you know it can be very harmful right now okay so- thank you and um, my, my second question um siobhan is around and Orlea touched on deprivation but I, I wanted you to if you could for us just to give us a, a better understanding of of, of the uh, of what this means and it explain to us how deprivation leads to increased um risk of mental illness um i mean is it is it linked to having a stake in education or employment or are there intergenerational factors 
it's everything. So living in deprivation, um, it, you know, that could mean that your your housing is less than adequate. It could mean that your income is reduced. Both of those things reduce your sense of sta- safety and your, you know, that that sense that everything's going to be okay. If you're if you're constantly worried that you're going to be made homeless, that is a constant fear. You know, if you if you're constantly worried that you're not going to have enough money to put food on the table or pay your bills or keep your house warm, then you know nothing else is right. To, if you're worried about those sorts of things. So it's about the psychological safety. It's also in Northern Ireland about recognizing that um, there are generational effects here that parents, whenever they're you know in that state of constant fear, that they're not able to relate to their children as well. And they can create adversities for, for their children as a result of that, which impacts them on their children's mental health. So it's again, it's that walking on eggshells idea. It's living your life in fear that you're not going to have enough, that you're children won't have enough that you won't be able to clothe them that you won't be able to do the basic things um that, that you need so that that's really what deprivation is it's also that lack of hope maybe that you feel that you don't have a stake in education that you know your children won't um have the hope of getting a really good job and and really contributing to the economy and having a meaningful life and all of those things so it's about perception as well as, as everything else um but if you can give people safety security like um a basic income that they can survive you know they, they will be much more content and they will be less likely then to develop mental health problems or even external manifestations of that emotional dysregulation that's social violence we're talking about really that's when people get angry and they get in the streets and they cause difficulties for themselves and others but again it's all about that internal fear and anxiety that that's just all all their life you know that's part of their world it's part of their life a lot of us don't even recognize it you know if we're living in a situation of privilege we don't we've no idea we've no clue what that's like Absolutely. Um, Siobhan, I just wanted to thank you because you, you, you explain things so easily. I could quite happily listen to you all day um, because you have a very sensible, clear approach to, to, to explaining your, your thoughts and whatnot. So thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Pam. And going across then to Jerry Carroll. Jerry, go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Siobhan, for, for your presentation and all your all your very very important and, and uh, valuable work. Thanks for that. Um, I'll try to do one at a time. So I don't know how much time I have to ask questions, Siobhan. So <laughs> bear with me as long as you can. Um, I like your focus uh, on sort of building communities and relationships, uh, sort of in the in the aftermath of, of COVID. I think that was very very important, and and your emphasis on trustworthiness and transparency in terms of uh, services and information that people get. I think is very very crucial um i just want, wanted to sort of get your thoughts on um the idea or the suggestion that we might be you know solely or primarily focus on a pharmaceutical uh, or medicinal um focus on on tackling mental health uh, illness or issues i mean obviously you know goes without saying medicine can provide important uh, use for people, people who are severely uh, distressed, or, or 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 whatever the ca- the case may be. But I've I've seen one report to suggest that there's a um, in one avenue there's three times more spent um, on uh, on antidepressants than there there is on counselling. So do you feel that there's an over uh, medication uh, focus on on this issue, and and there should be more of a focus on the likes of uh, communities and relationship building, as you uh, suggested. Um, well, yeah, of course, th- that's naturally what I'm suggesting. You know, um, the response, the, the healing occurs through relationships, through communities, through connection, through regulating activities. Um, medication can can help with that, and it's been really, really useful for people. Um, um, many of us know, you know, how powerful an antidepressant can be. You, but it takes a number of weeks to work. It, it stabilizes your mood, but there there are side effects with that as well for many people. And and they only work in in, in this, you know, when a portion of the time sometimes they don't work sometimes they make things work so you know the answer is not really through through medication but it can be helpful as part of a program of um program of of work of 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 therapy really the the nice recommendations are that that medications used in conjunction with with counseling with talking therapies um so that should be provided but unfortunately we we don't have we don't have enough counselors we don't have enough psychologists trained um and the, the workforce 
planning issue is there as well. Um, and that's why we need a mental health strategy that goes over 10 years so we can start to make sure that all the, the talking therapists are there. So um, that, that's that's why we need to move on this on this strategy. Um, the increase in antidepressants hasn't been as big, though, as I expected, Jerry. I have to say. It seems to me there's an increase in the cost now, and that's something we do need to look at because are the pharmaceutical companies charging more? Who's, you know, who's, who's benefiting from this? Who, who's making money out of this? Um, but, but yeah, medication absolutely has its place and can help, particularly in the short term, can be really, really helpful, but it's not going to change underlying problems. You know, when I talk about safety planning, problem solving, those kind of things, emotional regulation, um, medication is not a quick fix. But, but the other medication that people use is alcohol. You know, lots of people are already using alcohol as a way of self-medicating. Of I mean, we know the regulating effect of alcohol it calms us down, but then over the long term, there's a flip side of that too. So um, chemicals, yeah, chemicals work, but exercise works, connecting really, really works. Um, there's lots of other things that work too, which which we'd like to try, and people want that as well. You know, so. Um, that that's so we need to broaden the availability of talking therapies. That's in the strategy. It's urgent. It is urgent too. But we need to, we need to train people to, to be able to do it as well. Thanks, Siobhan. Um I'll just do a couple of quick fire questions and let you answer them as best as you can. Um, I, I think the um, the mental health strategy. Jerry, 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 just Jerry, just 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 like uh, we do have a little bit more time with with. Uh, Siobhan than we did with with uh, so I, I just don't, I want members to know that um we hopefully can spend a little bit more time so don't okay. don't be rushing it needlessly um I do I don't want members to filibusters all the way to to close the play but um hopefully we'll have a little bit more time with Siobhan this morning. Thanks, uh, Colin. Thank, thanks, Siobhan. Normally we're, we are rushing, so it's good to have a bit more time. So uh, I'll, I'll let uh, over again, but I'll take a bit of time. Thanks, um, Siobhan. Remember. The mental health strategy, um, I raised this with the minister a few weeks ago, um, doesn't address the fact that um, there's a lack of in-house counselling services uh, in GPs. Uh, my own constituency in West Belfast, 50% uh, of GP services don't have any in-house uh, mental health uh, counselling services. So that's that's very, very concerning. And I wonder if you have any uh, comment and view on that. Um, the, the, other, the other concern I have is the CAMS waiting list. I put in an assembly question. I think it's uh, 1,600 or, or approximately that number, uh, 1,600 people waiting on a, on a first um, uh, appointment with CAMS. So I'm kind of concerned about you know the effect and the ability for people to be seen uh, when they need, when they need to be, but also uh, whether when they can be after the pandemic, whether there'll be enough resources um, uh, for them. Um, and then just just finally, um, yeah, I think I think the point around uh, the summer um, is very important. I'm glad you raised it because I'm concerned that there's an approach that basically says uh, pupils missed a lot of uh, uh, school time, which they obviously did in the last year. But the the solution is you know force them back into in the school in the middle of summer, and uh, not really for any focus on well being, uh, but primarily because um, you know education is focused towards exams and you know in many cases pleasing adults rather than benefiting young people uh, so i hope that that is an approach where people are, are forced back in the, in the classroom and schools when they really should be out um you know socializing with their with their peers so uh, any comments on that would be uh, great thank you Okay, so let's take counselling in GP practices. Um, there, there's a number of really successful models where counsellors are in in house in GP practices, and that's that's great. And we want, I would want to see that included in the strategy because at the minute it's not really. But the main model that's been used is this idea of a psychological therapy hub, um, and that again the. The important thing for me is that people have access through their GPs and that it's close. They don't have to get 10 buses to get to, the, to their, their appointment, that it's available at a time that suits them. So if they're working during the day or if they have child care responsibilities, it can be flexible. So all of these things are really important and we, we need to make sure that it's accessible within a very short waiting time. And, and PPR's target of 28 days, I think, is spot on the market. It should be, it should be around that. You know, that, that's a reasonable time for somebody who's not in urgent need. Um, obviously, crisis intervention services are different but um but some of the gp federations and gps are telling us that they don't have the 
accommodation and the practice and that they would typically refer to the psychological therapy hubs or the community and voluntary sector services locally, which works for them. So I, I would be in favor of this sort of blended approach. But the important thing is that everybody has access to a talking therapy within a couple of weeks from their GP. Um, and even a GP appointment can be really hard to get as well. The, the other element of this is that there's multidisciplinary teams now in many GP practices where there's a worker there designated to um, see people who are coming with mental health issues and help triage them and work out what the best service is for them. And I think that's a really important development. But it's again about bringing it right into the community, you know, making sure that people can go to somewhere that's familiar and access uh, a therapy or a counselling in, in, a, in a timely way um, that, that, that meets their needs, you know, without having to travel away or sit in waiting lists for ages. Because people get worse when they're in waiting lists. And, and it sends that message that there's not, you know, there's nothing we can do here and our services are poor. And actually, there are some really great services and the potential is huge to deliver really good services for people if we if we implement the strategy fully um which also touches on your question on the cams waiting list that's far too long we know that if you get in there early for children and young people that you can make a real difference and turn things around you know mental illness impacts and educational outcomes it impacts and everything um so we we need to be we need to be much more prompt there a lot of the trusts are moving forward and again when the referrals come in they're trying to prioritize the really urgent ones so, you know, there, that means they're waiting list. The pandemic hasn't helped. But if you look at men, the mental health strategy, there's actions in there. And these needs, these are priorities because of the preventative element. So you have a young person now who may need a dual diagnosis services service in 10 years time if they don't get prompt mental, mental health treatment. So it really is cost effective to, um, to prioritize those younger age groups. In terms of the summer and children in schools, it is absolutely biologically impossible to learn when you're in that state of anxiety, when you're dysregulated. Um, I mean, I know what it was like trying to prepare lectures around that time when the lockdown happened. I couldn't focus. I couldn't do anything. You know, if you're really tired, you can't work. We, we all have experience of this. So we should not be expecting our children to come right back into school to start exams again. And they're not. it's not going to be possible anyway because they want to talk and connect with their friends. They'll be jittery. They'll be, you know, all of those behavioural things that that kids do whenever they whenever they're a bit dysregulated and a bit anxious and a bit nervous. So you know it, it makes sense to prioritise emotional regulation and to do all those connecting things. But I I very much fear that it's not happening. And the reports anecdotally that I'm hearing is it's about getting the kids back and actually you know they have more exams to do now because it's, it's spread out because we don't want to, we don't want to hit them with those sort of single exams. I, I don't know what the answer is. But I think there's a big conversation needs to happen around education generally. And I'm hoping the review that's going to be commencing shortly um, will, will go some way to address that. Thanks, Siobhan. Thank you very much, Fred. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. So I have now in the following order, I'm going to Carol Neekillen, then Cara Hunter, and then Paula Bradshaw. So go ahead, Carol, please. Thank you, um, Chair, and thank you, Siobhan um, and Peter, this morning. Um, Siobhan, you, you did rightly mention the primary talking therapies and the and the hubs, but yesterday and just last night, I was I, I was dealing with groups within the community and voluntary sector who have had their contracts awarded by the trust with up to a forty percent reduction, and that's really really concerning. And then the other issue is that they have to their insurance doesn't cover them around cybersecurity, and these are the people, in my opinion who are frontline, have been frontline throughout this pandemic, and I'm really, really concerned about that. I also um, have raised this, and will be raising it again, I've raised it with the trust, but can you just, you know, within the mental health uh, strategy, you know, talk about the importance of the primary talking therapies, because we are going to look at chemical solutions, we are going to look at the adverse impacts of poor mental health, and the fact that these vital, I mean, in my opinion, life-saving services in our community, um, who I've referred many to, I, I would see this as a, a really, really retrograde step. So that would be my first question. 
I, I have to agree with you, Carol. It's it's awful. We know that the community and voluntary sector have been picking up the pieces in the pandemic. They really, really have. You know, and it's exactly the opposite of the kind of thing that I'm calling for. Um, so we need to understand why it's happening and what we can do about it. Um, because that's, you know, the, the, the work they do, the links with the community, it's from the ground up. It's everything that's right about this. And it will save money in the long term if we invest in those services right now. So, I mean, Peter, Peter's here with me today and we'll, we'll chat about this later and, and get um, and get some more information. We've also received your correspondence around the insurance issue yeah. um, and we're addressing that. Peter, do you want to come in there on that or has, has there been any response yet about what we can do there? We're still looking into it, Siobhan, at the minute. We're trying to um, see what options are available to us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, it's yeah. a stick like, but we we're aware of of that issue. I wasn't aware of the forty percent reduction in services. You know, it's just going to cost us more, and we're all going to suffer if we don't do this right. That's the whole point I'm making. You know, so I'm I'm with you on this, and it's I'm not I'm very idealistic. But you hear stuff like this, and it does make you despair sometimes. So uh, so we'll have a look at it, and, and let's let's get together soon as well, Carl, yeah. to yeah. talk it through a wee bit more if we can. No, listen, I appreciate that. It's just that uh, I actually, I, I would say the first time in a whole year this pandemic, I I felt really sad listening to people who had our backs, our families' backs, everybody's families' backs, when above and beyond, working with health and social care staff, sitting in the car park with them before they put their scrubs and PPE on, you know, telling them it's okay, people who were absolutely petrified and into work, and this is how they were treated. I just felt horrendous for them. Uh, and I felt like, you know, they've been let down badly. Uh, but, but I also am determined, like all members of this committee, to ensure we get, get them supported, Siobhan. And Peter, the other questions about have is this, and Orlea has rightly, you know, and yourself have been very, very proactive and positive on the dual diagnosis in the mental health services. But I, I am really fearful that when we met with the some members of Belfast Trust and Mental Health Team, and even correspondence from the minister, there is no intention or vision to look at after hours or after after hours services, um, even using the community and voluntary sector, and that's that's alarming. And then the other issue, Siobhan, is, and I'll finish in this column because I know you've been really. Um, flexible. I've recently worked with some of the people who have been impacted by the neurology um, debacle and they are traumatized as a result of, in my opinion, very professional reporting in the Irish news, but they really are re-traumatized. And I'm just wondering how we can, we can help those people because they're going to everybody for support and why people are acknowledging their pain. We, I just don't know practically what we can do to get them more answers from the likes of the department and indeed the trust. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, so the first point is about out of our services. Really, really important because that's the crisis that, that we're talking about that leads people to hopelessness and suicidal behaviour and all the rest. And and the, the review of, I could come back to the review of crisis intervention services, but I would be very hopeful that that will be that out of hours contact but continuous contacts with just it's not just a one off service and then it will be linked and networked into the um to the mental health services. The 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 group who are working on this, Rory O'Connor's part of, of that group and they've designed DBI Scotland, Distress Brief Intervention Scotland, and they provide fourteen days of continuous follow up and they link people with mental health services and do the safety but so so I would be hopeful that whenever we're reviewing crisis intervention services that, that would cover some some of this, but let you know, I, I constantly may I on this one because this is the group of people who are very prone to suicidal thoughts and behaviors, and that's when when these thoughts come and when the behaviors happen. So we need to get this right. So absolutely understand your concern there. Um, but you know, April is, and we're nearly in April, so April's the kind of deadline for that for that review to happen. So let let's keep an eye on it. I, again, it can't come soon enough. People are suffering right now. You know, last night, today, like there are people maybe watching this who are struggling, and and that's what I'm conscious of as well. Um, 
In terms of the neurology recall, um, we, we've met with that group a couple of times. We haven't heard the the reports about the media, but we do know that the media, how the media talk about any issue when it relates to mental health, really can re-traumatize. And a trauma-informed approach is about those public conversations, how we talk about people, how we've talked about how we talk about people who are suffering and continue to suffer. Um, so there's a bit of awareness raising there that we can do, and there's some good guidance around how. Yeah, go on. It wasn't a, it wasn't a bad reporting in the media. What happened was the consultant to Bazaar to investigate. Dr. Watts is now under investigation by the GMC and the media were just reporting that investigation. So it, so it wasn't like to be fair that they haven't followed the guidelines. If anything, they reported what the families approached them with just to be to be clear on that. Okay, okay. Sorry, I'm not across this, Carl. That's, oh my goodness. So what you're talking about is a group of people who've been injured once and then they find this, that's... That's horrendous. Um, and again, it's going to cause distress. I think distress is a very normal reaction to that kind of thing. I, w I wouldn't be surprised if it did. Um, we have a meeting coming up with the Belfast Trust to discuss how we support the um, the, script, the script of people. And that's what we requested, you know, so we'll keep them informed as well about any support that we can provide. Again, it's, it's not even necessarily providing treatments for a mental illness, but it's just knowing that there are people there who care and can listen to them and can help them if they do, um, if they, if they do need further, further treatments. But, you know, that's understandably just so distressing, you know, your heart would go out. I'm like, I, yeah. 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 Yeah, no, we, 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 we must we must be really careful how we engage and how we protect and support victims in, in across these entire range of scandals which are out there and, and subject of inquiries. So I agree with that. Okay, thank thank you for that. I'm going to go across then to Chiara Hunter. Go ahead there, Chiara, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you so much, Yvonne, for your time. Um, your work's absolutely crucial, and I agree with Pam's comments earlier. You always break it down in such an easy and digestible way, so thank you. Um, being an MLA for a rural constituency, my first question um, is just around those, again, those rural barriers to access for mental health support. Um, I know we've seen some really good initiatives, um, such as the Farm Families Health Checks Programme, um, and kind of outreaching into those rural areas and accessing kind of those um, like farmers that wouldn't traditionally have the time or would want to come forward. So I'm just wondering if you could detail, um, you know, any information on that or any kind of updates around it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Cara. And as a rural dweller myself, I am so acutely aware of the needs of, the, of this population. Um, so, yeah, this this is where we need that cross-departmental approach, really, isn't it? Because what's happening with Project Stratum influences whether I can do meetings. You know, I'm on different 4G things here. Um, so the, the Wi-Fi, the broadband, all of that is crucial. Um, and making sure that people aren't isolated, you know, because isolation then is stressful. And, and when a lot of things are going online like this, people benefit, but other people, if you don't have the connectivity or if you can't afford to pay for data, that's a problem. So all of these things are um, things that, that, that health, health services need to be conscious of that as well and need to be providing devices and equipment and data if that's necessary for people to connect with services. Um, but a lot of the most powerful things that are done for mental health and well-being in rural communities are those communities group, those um, the, the, the groups that dial, the, the ringing every morning, that ring people who are isolated and connect and talk to people and make sure, um, and, and local councils, what they do with their play parks. I mean, I spent the last two days in play parks with my wee one, and it's just so important for their well-being as well. So I think there's a cross-departmental thing that has to happen here. I met with Minister Putz, you know, and he's very, very interested in um, rural mental health, the farmers' mental health, but also in the women in those families because they're at high risk as well of being isolated, um, particularly if they don't have that that work, you know, the the, the kind of connection and the face to face stuff that happens through work. So they can feel very, very isolated. So he's bringing forward a range of programs there and the farm health checks as part of that, but including a little mental health and well being check in there. Not again, the message is not to say that you're all mentally ill. Most of us really aren't, but getting across those five steps to well being and letting people know if they're secretly struggling, if they're feeling suicidal, that they're you know, there's a lot of support and help for them if if that's where they are. 
So yeah, a lot of stuff happening across departmental approach, but improving infrastructure and um, Wi-Fi broadband, all that is part of mental health too. Thank you. That's such a, such a great um, answer. Um, I think when you touch on the cross departmental approach, I think one thing I know from students and from young people, um, and it's interesting you had talked about that age group, you know, 18 to 29, there's a real, um, you know, problem with access and jobs at the moment. There's not many part-time jobs, full-time jobs. And then there's that shame and stigma of, you know, you've just got your degree um, and, you know, perhaps you have to go to the dole and all these kinds. Of, it's a really difficult part in their life. They've just got a degree. It's been a high. And then now, um, you know, lack of available jobs has just been a big issue. It's definitely coming through my office. Um, just around that again of 18 to 29 uh, i know we had talked previously about the important role um things like sports clubs can play local gaa clubs football clubs cricket clubs um and, and really tapping into especially uh men young men and those groups as well that don't tend to come forward to seek help i'm just wondering if you've had any kind of conversations with them around um champion mental health on the ground um and then again that ties into rural uh, the rural aspect of it as well i suppose thank you yeah, again, Cara, really, really good point. Those those community organisations are crucial. Um, we met with Ulster GAA, Ulster Rugby and the IFA um, and we talked about, we're planning to make them a sport NI to try and bring them all together to do something kind of across all the organisations and to bring in more women organisations too because, you know, sport's important for women but th there's just such a dip and a decline after primary school in girls' participation in sport but it, it's so powerful being part of that team, you know, those teen sports, like that is the connection. That's the yeah. connection that we're talking about that are healing, that are therapeutic, that make you feel good about yourself, that make you feel part of something. Um, so they're all they're all doing really great work and they all have great campaigns um where they're training people at club level to be those compassionate connectors to reach out to help um uh, to help support people with mental health problems and and for anybody that might be struggling with suicidal thoughts to to get them the support that they need so those organizations are are running champions and i, I want to see champions everywhere mental health champions like that that's that's the vision um but but they're they're already doing a lot of this work so it's it's for me about telling the pop, telling people, people in rural areas, get connected with your local clubs, find out what's there. You know, there's lots of things there. But of course, we withdraw, you know, we, when we feel lonely and when we're scared, we withdraw because because that's a fear response. So getting the message out about what's available um, and getting the support, making sure that we don't take money away or resources away from those groups and that we mobilize so mm -hmm. that we get together and, and use um use the people that we have and those and those community groups to the best the best way that we can so we all win you know yeah definitely local conversations i've had you know with own road be my local club and then cory and fc it's kind of expanding the conversation with with health and you know improving well-being and that kind of holistic approach it's not just about fitness it's about that kind of team support that you're talking about um i won't keep you too long i just a few more questions i'll put them together um you talked about the regeneration of deprived areas i'm just wondering could you touch a wee bit more on that i find that a really interesting point um and also on the matter of eating disorders um do you think we need to change our, po our, our approach from an educational perspective and to get in younger um with the early intervention aspect of things and if there's any conversations around that ongoing i'd love to know more thank you Okay, so the regeneration of deprived areas, it's about, again, creating um, creating that sense of well-being that, you know, th that because you live in this area, you deserve nice things. You know, it's about the nice playground. It's about the community provision. It's about what's there. It's about how we look after the area. It's, it's everything. And that, that helps people feel proud of themselves and proud of where they're from, which is enormously important for well-being and, and reduces the risk of mental illness. So it's it's just it's very simply just targeting those areas that have been disadvantaged. And we can we know where they are, like we're, we're well aware of them. But there's such a, a, a social class gradient in Northern Ireland in terms of mental health. It's really, really huge. You know, by so by just putting nice things into deprived areas, we can make a 
make difference to the problems that that, that that we have because you know it's that lack of hope it's that psychological um instability you know the lack of psychological safety that you know that our children have a good future if you're a parent you know you you just want the best for your child and then you feel safe you know you feel secure you can you can be content and happy then as well so that that's really really important um so when we're thinking about where we're locating jobs where we're locating new businesses where we're incentivizing businesses um and how we're incentivizing businesses that's what we should be looking at um as as we go forward so that's uh, something for the economy for for all of those other i mean it's cross departmental again it's, it's outside of the mental health strategy unfortunately <laughs> Uh, so eating disorders, yeah. So it, it it is just really worrying that young people are controlling their eating, um, and that you know all of these fasting diets and things like that that feeds into it as well as a culture that that you know privileges and um, sets as as a positive positive role models people that are way way too thin, you know. And it's this, it's it's all of that stuff really. Um, but it's also about recognizing that how we eat is part of our well being, and maybe even GPs asking about eating. You know, are you eating well? And we know there's a big problem, for example, as well with man malnutrition in older people where they're not looking after themselves properly um maybe after a spouse dies and, and things like that you know and a hungry animal will feel frightened you know that's a very natural response that fear um but it also it's also used as a way of controlling um your emotional response so it's a very very complex thing but they get a message out that that eating well and i don't i even hesitate to use the word diet but eating well is part of looking after yourself it's part of self care um, and that's what we need to be doing as we come out of this pandemic and not worrying too much I guess about um, weight gain and, and, and those things but ju just raising awareness generally about the importance of eating behaviour. I mean it is so scary when, when we hear of people being admitted to hospital um, dangerously, dangerously underweight you know because it's gone out of control but it hasn't really been noticed um, and people with, with eating disorders will cover it up you know, they will cover up what they're doing. And the other thing, of course, is binge eating disorder is something that's really not recognized as well. Um, but that's that's a big problem where people eat large quantities of food. Again, it's about coping with stress. It's about regulation, but it can be quite harmful. You know, so all of everything we do, our relationship with food is so important. And we need to try and, and promote, promote that in a, in a much, much better way um, in Northern Ireland. Thank, thank you very much, Siobhan, and thank you, Kira. Um, and Paula Bradshaw, go ahead, Paula, please. And um, thank you, Siobhan, um, for coming this morning. It's been fascinating, and a lot of the issues I was going to raise have already been raised, which which is good. But I just wanted to pick up on that last point around eating disorders, and I was sort of getting to it last week when my technology failed, and it was really about people who are, are maybe overweight and aren't maybe diagnosed as being bulimic or others. And I'm not saying everybody who's overweight has got a mental health problem, but I do think that there is a link then, as you say, towards sort of your self-esteem and especially during lockdown, there's the potential then when people put weight on, clothes are starting to get a bit tighter and stuff. That I, I think there's a wider issue around um, our relationship with food. So I just, if you can reflect that in the, in the um, mental health strategy. I just wanted to pick up on um, a couple of issues there. You had talked about some outreach um, for certain sections of society at the far side of the pandemic and I suppose I would just be sort of championing the, the people who would have been shielding the CEV um, who've been very anxious and also I don't think many people have given enough recognition to those who have been on furlough in the retail or hospitality sector you know their sense of purpose of getting up every day and going to work and earning a living even though they've got an income I suppose we, we sort of forget we think oh well they're still getting paid but you know they're, they're maybe at home and and say not having that fulfillment that we get from from work and interacting with others so again that's another one i'd raise but the last one would be around those people who are on waiting lists and um, we had a royal college of surgeons last week and then uh, departmental officials briefed us on the waiting list and i suppose the, the, the delay in getting your diagnosis, whether it's neurological or musculoskeletal, you know, deal, dealing daily with pain and concerns about what what you know what your life was going to turn out once you get your diagnosis. So, just wondering if you could speak to just really engaging with certain sections of society that are maybe hard to reach. 
Yeah, so so really good points. The first one um, on obesity, I, I mean, the, the pennies only just sort of very recently dropped with me that obesity is actually on that spectrum of eating disorders and binge eating often contributes to obesity. Um, so how we talk about obesity is really important too. And you hit the nail on the head there. It's about our relationship with food and it's about our self-care and self-compassion. It's about self-awareness, recognizing when we're struggling and how we use food and feeding ourselves well and all of those things. So um, again, a more nuanced conversation about food and also the physical activity does help with that as well, um, you know, and, and it's good for your mental health and well-being. So I, I you know, I've been really struck by the, the health psychology community have been saying recently about how the anti, some of the anti-obesity campaigns can be tw- quite triggering for people who've got eating disorders. So we just need to be aware of all of that um, when we're planning what we're doing and it needs to be in the strategy. You're absolutely right. And I'll, you know, I'll be adding it to my response as well. Obesity as well as eating disorders. Um, the, the group here on furlough, much of the data is saying as long as the financial security and as long as they feel stable again, that you know their jobs are not at risk, that they, they're not doing too badly. But you're right, there is that fear of coming back out again, of you know even the weight gain or whatever it is. For me, it's wearing heels again and having to commute and stuff like that. That's going to be really tricky. And we need that sort of staged return and a wee bit of flexibility from employers to help us navigate that. Because if we're coming to work and we're stressed and anxious, we're not going to be doing too well either. You know, So it's about recognizing how all these things play together and taking the good out of what has happened over the past year. So if we can do... A couple of meetings by Zoom, not everything, please. But, you know, if we can do that so that people can spend more time with their kids, that would be brilliant. Like, that's trauma-informed because you're prioritizing those really crucial relationships. Um, so that's what I would say about furlough. But but just just being aware that there is anxiety out there right right now. Um, and lots of, lots of people are a wee bit scared. But we'll be okay. You know, the transition will be all right. It was a big shock at the start. So we can do this in a more staged way. Um, um, the final bit about waiting list, this, this really worries me because, you know, that's also a competition for funds from from uh, health, you know, to tackle waiting lists. And it's really important because people are deteriorating on waiting lists. They're, you know, chronic pain. Oh, my goodness. Like that just creates mental illness there. You've got the two things together. You've got something that's creating more mental health problems and you're going to need more money to try and solve that as well. Um it, it's it just must be a priority, but we can't we can't kind of wait for waiting lists, you know. And this is why the mental health strategy has got to be action straight away. So this is a separate area of health, and I I just hope that there are people looking at it. And I know the minister's very very concerned, but this is something that, you know, it's going to take billions, isn't it? But we we need to do this to turn Northern Ireland around. We absolutely need to address waiting lists, but we can't. We we need to move on with mental health and prevention and mental health services at the same time so that's kind of my focus and my role um thank you just to come back on one point there I, i'm very supportive of, of the ambition around the trauma-informed society and i'm just wondering how you're linking in there with the safeguarding board of their work around aces informed society they they're a couple of years ahead of you and i think they've done some amazing work in terms of teachers and frontline um, staff like police officers and stuff so i'm just wondering what, what way you're interacting with the safeguarding board thank you yeah, I've had several discussions. So prior to this, in my university role, I've been developing trauma-informed. Yes, is informed as trauma-informed. It's it's about the awareness of, of childhood adversities as impacting on that biological stress response. So yes, is is really kind of it's about trauma in childhood and the absolute you know importance of avoiding them and recognizing early what the what the um what the result of trauma in childhood and what it looks like and what it is. So it's all part of the same thing and it's brilliant that this is I can see the ripples already through the police through the prison system you know through my contacts with criminal justice you know this is part of the language that they use and they talk about aces and trauma um, the danger with aces is that the ace scale is a kind of a checklist um, you know which which leads us down the road of counting up traumas and going oh my goodness everybody's ill which is not what we want if you know what I mean so it's about recognizing that we are so hugely resilient but we need to nurture those relationships and connections in childhood um, so that we get healthy adults who will be able to cope with stress and pressure and not create any more stress and pressure for themselves through the way that they engage thank you very much thank you, thank, thank you Paula um, and I'm going then to Alan Chambers go ahead Alan please 
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Siobhan, I'd like to thank you for your presentation this morning and, and appreciate the energy that uh, you've brought to your uh, post. Uh, and I know that you have been highlighting that mental health issues are not something to be hid behind closed doors or closed curtains. Um, my question is, it's not a criticism aim that anyone should want, uh, but I know that there have been worrying gaps in the past. And it's uh, around the issue of the, the police, the PSNI. And I, I'm just wondering, are there established pathways uh, for the police uh, to direct people who may have come to their attention, might have walked into a police station, or might even be, have been arrested for a minor offence? Are there pathways for the police to direct them directly to uh, mental health uh, uh, services and advice? Thank you. This is a really important point, Alan. Yeah, um, in some places there are. It's 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 you know it's patchy, and it really depends on the nature of the person's needs um, in terms of their mental health and what substances they've taken as well. Um, and also then, if the person is in in custody or even in prison, you know that's different again. So that linking up of, of health with the criminal justice system, we need to improve that. But the, the crisis intervention services that are around at the minute, um, certainly the one that I'm familiar with in the Northwest is a very good liaison with the police. So police can you know, bring people there if they're in a suicidal crisis. And those multi-agency response teams, again, they can help people in a suicidal crisis. But unfortunately, you know, whenever people are in the criminal justice system, it can be difficult for them to access mental health services. You know, And that link between justice and health needs to be strengthened. And that actually would be one of the criticisms of the, the strategy. You know, the strategy is a health strategy, but how does it connect with justice? How does it connect, you know, with education as the other one? So we need to, to make sure that those lines are there so that there's a, you know, a referral there for people who are in contact with criminal justice. Um, because it's really important because mental health is related to offending behavior. Because if you, you know, the, the, those stress responses lead people to externalize, they get, people get angry, they get aggressive and they get into trouble and, and they end up in criminality. So if we can get an air um, with all the prevention stuff and the trauma-informed stuff, we might actually reduce this at the other end of it too. Thank you, Siobhan, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Okay, thank you very much, Siobhan. Um, I, that was, I think, a, a really, really good session, a really good catch-up. The committee have been quite aware and concerned of you know the issues that are facing us in terms of mental health and I, and I think it's right to also look at the positives and look at, at how we can support each other and all of that I'm not I'm not always happy about the use of the word resilience and that it sometimes um, doesn't deal with the underlying problems that are causing the issues and and I recognize that you have also pointed out some of those very very key issues going forward and I think that's that's really useful um so listen, I, I want on behalf of the committee to thank yourself and Peter for coming along this morning, to thank you for your work to date and to uh, indicate that we certainly as a committee will wish to support you and anyone else who is, who is including the executive with the Mental Health Action Plan and all of that. We will be very keen that this area will get a particular focus and I think we're all particularly aware, or aware around children's mental health and the additional difficulties that this pandemic has created for them around the whole issue of school and sports and all of that. So I want to wish you and all of your team the very best of luck in the time ahead. And I think I think we uh, we, we certainly will all look forward to reviewing and keeping in touch with this issue as it develops and seeing how this can all be addressed and rolled out. But for now, thank you. Gorma. Thank you so much, Colin, okay. and thank you everybody and take good care of yourselves. Bye bye. Thank you, Chair. Okay, bye. Okay, members, any any quick comments in relation to that? I thought that was a really, really good uh, session with Siobhan. Is there, um, and I think I think it would be important that we build into our forward work program a review of this again sometime down the line in, in a reasonable sort of period of time, just so we we can keep our finger on this particular pulse as well. Carol, go ahead. Um, Chair, it's just that that issue I raised around the 40% funding is in relation to Belfast Trust, but I imagine that will be replicated across other trust areas. And I think it would be really appropriate just to ask the Minister 
um, and the department even, you know, what is the situation regarding these primary talking therapies and, and the hubs? Because um, it's it's really it's it's, it's really concerning at at this stage that they're being cut, cut to up to forty percent, and they're also being asked to pay additional thousands of pounds a year for insurance in relation to cybersecurity. It's going to mean those grassroots support mechanisms are going to disappear. I, I'm not being alarmist. That's that's potential impact. Okay, so we propose that we ask ask the right to the minister and ask for a breakdown across the other trust. Members content with that? Chair? Yep, go ahead, Paula. Thank you, Chair. Go and I, I was going to actually raise that issue myself, Carol, so thank you. Um, I, I, I am concerned that they keep setting up things like the mental health hubs and family support hubs, assuming that the community and boundary sector is going to be there to actually pick up the referrals. So I'm wondering if we as a committee should be looking at the role of the community and boundary sector, not just in mental health, but in terms of, of other frontline health and social care services to really get a feel for how they have fared through the pandemic and what support we could provide them, not just financially. Okay, thank you. Um, members content with that? Yeah. Very content with that. Yep, yeah, thank you. Okay, members, um, we are then moving on to looking at some of the SRs following this. But if I could, if I could ask for maybe if we take a 15 minute break at this point and members resume just after 12.20, if that would be okay, members, I'll see you all then. Thank you. Okay. So we will now resume our, our meeting and we will be moving now to consideration of SR 2020-2021, sorry, forward slash 46, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2 Amendment Regulations. So uh, I refer members there to your papers at tab 7 of your pack and particularly to the clerk's memo at tab 7.1. I can advise you members that a departmental official is here today to brief the committee on the provisions of this SR. So I'd now like to welcome Ms. Liz Redmond and Liz is Director of Population Health in uh, the department. So Liz, are you able to hear us there? So I see where Liz has now been brought into the spotlight. Liz, are you able to hear us there? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I'm hearing you now. I'm not seeing. Yes, now I'm seeing. I'm seeing and hearing. And um, Liz, if you do have access to a headset, that usually helps. But um, right. We we will we will see we will see how the sound goes. But listen, Liz, could you go ahead just and give us your briefing in relation to this item and this okay, SR? Thanks. Thank you. Okay. To tell me to speak louder if you if you're struggling with with hearing me. Um, so a, little, a little louder would actually be no, a little bit louder maybe might be useful, Liz, thanks. All right. Okay, look, thank you so much for inviting me today um, to speak to you. Uh, so as you've said, we're considering SR 46, that's amendment number five of 2021 to the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2 Regulations Northern Ireland. So um, as I usually do, I'll briefly summarise the context and then the content of this statutory rule and then take any questions after that. So if we start with the context, um, the amendment regulations we're discussing today arose from decisions made by the executive at the seventh formal review of the restrictions regulations, which took place on the 18th of February this year. At the time of the seventh review, the R number was generally decreasing for positive cases, hospitalizations and ICU occupancy. There were 460 COVID positive inpatients across the system, and that was down by a quarter over a 10 day roughly period. Um, however, the numbers of inpatients were still extremely high in comparison to the first wave, uh, for instance, where our peak in the first wave was 322 compared to on the 18th of February, 460. Um, they, these numbers were also higher still than when we brought in the four week restrictions on the 16th of October. At that time, they were 373. So it's just to give you an idea of, of what the hospital system was dealing with um, four weeks ago. The ICU occupancy of COVID positive patients had fallen slowly from the peak of 74. Um, on, which was recorded on the 25th of January. And at the time of this review, it was sitting at 51. 
Um, so that was that was a welcome decline, but it was still a very serious situation. Um, the numbers in ICU were only just below the numbers we'd seen in, in the previous two peaks. So um, just to remind you, um, in April, we had a peak of 54 in ICU and in November, 55. So also at the time of the seventh review, um, we had results in from different sources of uh, genomic data which suggested that the B117 viral lineage, that's the so-called Kent variant, uh, was accounting for approximately 70% of positive cases in Northern Ireland. Um, this variant was estimated to be up to 70% more transmissible compared with the previously dominant variant, meaning that under conditions of increased interpersonal contact, the number of cases could rise very sharply. Um, this would make the control of community transmission more challenging and result in increased infections, rates and hospitalizations, deaths and more pressure on the healthcare system from what was already a, a very high base. So very important that we were very cautious at this point. In addition, there was uncertainty regarding the presence of other new variants, such as those that had recently emerged in South Africa and in Brazil, neither of which had been identified in Northern Ireland at that time. And there was Another concern around this, which was mutation of the B117 variant and the possible impacts of that on a population that was still uh, quite exposed and a health system that was um, under a lot of pressure. So at the seventh review, the executive agreed that the existing restrictions um, should remain in place. Um, they were necessary and proportionate and they should be extended to midnight on the 31st of March with the next formal review to be completed on or before the 18th of March, which, which is today. The SR we are discussing today amended those dates in the regulations. As well as amending the dates, the seventh review um, at the executive uh, considered what small amendments might be uh, appropriate at that time. And the executive agreed to four additional changes to the restrictions, as well as the change in the dates. So from the 2nd of March, um, that was the day after this SR was made. The amendment uh, from that date permits customers um, of the motability service uh, to be accompanied by a carer to collect the motability vehicle. From the 8th of March, the amendment allows three further activities. It permits click and collect to operate for specific non-essential retail businesses. That's shops which sell baby equipment, clothing, footwear or electrical goods under the condition that payments are completed at the time of the order, be that online, by phone, text or post with no cash transactions permitted. The second amendment was around the increase in the number of people permitted to gather socially outdoors from a maximum of six from no more than two households to a maximum of 10 from no more than two households, while restrictions on all other outdoor gatherings, including sporting events or gatherings in private dwellings would remain unchanged. And lastly, it permits uh, government departments to use conference facilities to hold public inquiries. So just a few specific comments on these three. Regarding the motability scheme, um, there was an issue of practical difficulty highlighted by the examiner in her uh, report on SR27, you might recall, that's a, of amendment number three, and it was also discussed at this committee um, previously. Um, the amendment addresses that issue of concern by allowing that carer to accompany the person to collect their vehicle under the motability scheme. The amendment um, allowing limited opening of contactless click and collect of non-essential retail followed a consideration by the Department of Health and the Department for the Economy as to how click and collect services for non-essential retail business could be managed more safely. Um, following those discussions and engagement with retail businesses and representative bodies by the Department for the Economy, they took proposals to the executive. The Department of Health uh, recognised that as a consequence of the prolonged closure of non-essential retail, items that may not have been essential in the short term had become increasingly essential over time due to wear and tear, breakage or children's growth. Uh, this department also acknowledged that a staged approach to resumption of click and collect services may have a uh, less of a negative impact on positive, the positive progress that we were making 
um, in terms of turning the case numbers around and the hospitalizations and ICU capacity, as I outlined earlier, rather than a blanket approach to introducing across all retail at the same time. So the executive uh, decided to introduce phase one of the click and collect proposals of uh, DFE. Um, so as I mentioned, 8th of March, this uh, covered baby equipment, clothing and footwear and electrical goods. Um, it was considered that this was a way to test the approach more thoroughly um, uh, with a review of the evidence then relating to the impact on transmission and on compliance uh, before a, a more uh, wide scale rollout of click and collect in non-essential retail. And finally, um, the change around uh, the government departments um, being permitted to use conference facilities. Um, so the conference facilities are required to close, as you, as you know. Um, now, we also, we had extended the use of uh, uh, conference facilities uh, for holding courts, tribunals and appeals services activities. So this was an extension of that. We engaged with other departments on the numbers of attendees that would be likely for public inquiries, as well as the mitigations that would be put in place. And our chief medical officer and chief scientist um, were content to support this change. And so that was put into the regulation. So to summarize, SR 46, amendment number five of 2021 was made at 4.30 p.m. on the 1st of March, came into operation on the 2nd of March and on the 8th of March um, and remains in place today. So I hope that provides you with um, some background and uh, context to these amendment regulations. And I just want to remind uh, members that the scope, of course, of these regulations is far reaching across all the responsibilities of the um, executive. Um, so if I'm unable to provide an answer today, I'll certainly um, come back to you subsequent to the meeting. Thank you. OK, OK, thank you, Liz. And that's 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 a that's very good context and, and, uh, and a very good refresher in terms of the context of, of how that all came about. So thank you for that. I will go across now to members for questions. Um, bear in mind what you have said there. So I want to go first of all to Pam Cameron. Uh, Pam, go ahead, please. I'm just waiting momentarily, momentarily, Liz, for Pam to be brought up into the spotlight to feed in her question. If that doesn't happen within the next minute, That's I think nice. it is happening. Yeah, go ahead, Pam. Thanks, Chair. And um, thank you, Liz. Yes, that was a very useful um, overview and a reminder because it's very easy to get uh, to basically forget what you know what's gone before and things do move um, very fast. Although probably not fast enough for a lot of us at the moment. <laughs> Um, in terms of um, the uh, click and collect issue, I mean, certainly, I think it remains a, a big issue for for us as a party, and, and and certainly our view in terms of, you know, babies and young people, and and that very limited form of click and collect. And I have raised it before and talked about, you know, for instance, you know, I, do, I mean, I don't know how much good it would have been to me. Certainly, I mean, I don't have any young children anymore, but. You know, when your children are at a very young age, their feet grow very, very quickly. And it's it, it wouldn't be sufficient for, you know, for a mother or father to decide what shoe size their child is. So I don't know how much use that has been for parents, uh, you know, being able to, you know, order a pair of shoes and pick them up and just you just take a stab in the dark at, at what, you know, that need is for child. It is important um, that their feet are, are looked after because that can affect all sorts of other um physicalities around it so I, I do think we we should it's maybe not very balanced in terms of of, of that provision and certainly even for pregnant uh, mothers uh, and, and needing to choose a pram to sit their stature and that their needs you know that's that type of thing I don't think can be done really you know remotely the way we have been doing it and I do think the department should be looking at how they can um, go towards a more appointment based system something very controlled that would allow you know a much better service to be provided so i suppose on on the back of that um statement liz could you tell us what the response has been from businesses in those sectors where click and collect is currently permitted okay well the 
Uh, my understanding from our uh, economy colleagues are that they are in regular, in fact, daily contact with the three main retailer representative bodies and also with the environmental health officers who are responsible for enforcement. So my understanding from talking to my colleagues in DFE is that um, the, uh, info, uh, the compliance with the businesses that, the, that have opened has been good to date. And that's the sort of feedback the executive's going to need before they move on to the next phase, which would be looking at a wider opening of uh, non-essential retail click and collect services. Um, so the, the feedback that I've got through DFE, who are the ones in the front line of this, um, is that it's, that it's operating well. I do understand that it doesn't help all small businesses. In fact, some small businesses really struggle with it, and I um, can, can understand why that could be. Um, but certainly, uh, if, if you want to have a more direct feedback from them, we could always invite them along to these sessions if that would help. DFE, that is. DFE mm -hmm. officials who are doing that direct engagement. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm just want yeah, because it would be good to know whether they're, you know, is, if, is that, you know, is the, the negative aspects of it, is that being reported back and is that information being gathered? I'm just not sure how that would work in terms of children's shoes in particular. I, I just don't know how that would work. Yeah, I think this, the children's shoes is an interesting one. Um, and, and in fact, any clothing for growing people. Um, it, it, you know, I truly understand the challenge of that. Um, unfortunately, any time a person goes inside, the risk of transmission between people, however careful they are, does go up. And that, that is why this very cautious approach at the moment. So measuring feet would mean people would have to enter the shop and uh, inevitably that would lead to trying on shoes and so forth. So at this stage, we don't think that, that, that we're ready to allow that in terms of the rate of community transmission, the number of positive tests we're still getting. It's a fragile situation and none of this is ideal at all. It's about finding some, um, some pathways through it. I, I did actually wonder um, whether shoe retailers in particular had come up with any way to um to put tools online for for parents to in fact measure their own children's feet with tape measures um it's something i've, I've put to dfe colleagues actually because that would seem to be a solution and I, somebody in the world must have cracked that one um a way to do self-measurement of feet um but yeah it's not ideal i i completely accept it and that is why um, you know, these things are under constant review and the, the next step is to look at whether we can do a wider opening of Click and Collect um, and that, that's what was announced this week. It doesn't solve, however, the concern about the fitting. I, I completely accept that's, that's very difficult without having contact indoors, which is the very thing that we want to leave until, it's, uh, until later, really. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to labour the point, Liz, but, you know, given that children are going back to school as well, and we yeah. know a pair of school shoes, it, it, they're, you know, they're on children so long, and it's so important that they, they fit properly. So, and I don't, I don't think there's any, I don't know, I wouldn't like to see, you know, people kind of uh, self-measuring, trying to fit shoes, because we're not, you know, we're not experts in that type of thing. So I think, I don't know if, how appropriate that would be at all. And I, I think too, we're, we're also missing the point that, you know, I'm sure many parents have been forced to go to supermarkets and kit out their kids with shoes there and clothes there, um, which, you know, that's, it makes a midpoint uh, in terms of, you know, bringing people into shops. I mean, you've got crowded supermarkets, you know, massively crowded and no control there. Um, and, and yet we're worrying about opening up a shop and having an appointment system so that people could actually get the appropriate clothing and footwear. I, I do think it needs looked at again in, in truth. But I'll, I'll, leave it, I'll leave that there, Liz. Um, and just ask, um, as more regulations are relaxed and um, I'm wondering, will the department extend its cluster outbreak monitoring to include retail sector and publish the findings so that, so that we have some evidence as to you know, the impact of opening in certain sectors? Yes, look, um, the, 
the monitoring they do already encompasses retail. So I don't know if you've yet picked up that the PHA regular reporting now includes reporting on um, uh, situations where clusters are found under general categories. If you haven't located that, I could send you the link. Um, but retail at the moment, I'll just find it if I can uh, quickly, but retail at the moment is um, the, the place where, uh, it's the second highest place. The, the highest place, the highest place is work, workplaces. And I think at the moment, when you look at the settings, it reflects where people are currently permitted to go. So it's really proportional to that. Wherever people are able to mix, that's where you're getting clusters and settings. The second highest numbers are um, related to retail and that's staff, because of course staff are going in and they're uh, mixing. And of course, as you've rightly pointed out, the big supermarket chains are open. So there's staff in there uh, working through through the day and night there. So um, we know looking at, and when you see this, you'll see all the categories, zero, zero, zero. That's just because those things are not happening in our economy at the moment. But I think what this shows me is that wherever you've got people who mixing indoors, you're going to get clusters and outbreaks at, at the point we're at at the moment, which is we haven't got this virus right down. It, there's still virus, you know, we're still getting in the order of 170 positive cases a day. And if each one of those people infects two others very quickly, you've got that escalating situation again. Yeah. I think that's what we're so concerned about. Yeah, and I, I do appreciate that, but I, but I and I suppose we have to take into account the new variants as well and the yeah. fact that they're they're more transmissible. So I completely get that, but I do still think that if you're you're almost forcing everybody to go to the same venues, and you're actually causing a, you know a crowded scenario. I mean, the supermarkets are crowded; they are. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I do think if you had other avenues and other ways to open up safely they should be taken because really that's going to actually uh, reduce those crowds and, and, and surely be more controlled. But I'll so leave it at that. Was, yeah, I was just going to say your suggestion about appointments, I think is, you know, really a valid suggestion. And I'll certainly make sure our DfE colleagues who are in the lead on this um, uh, have that feedback. I'm sure they're, they're looking at it. I, I know they're, they're definitely examining how they can they can get through this. So and, and make appreciate that. I did think it would have been already looked at because it was raised with yeah. the minister in the chamber and, and he did respond to it um, positively. And that was yeah. a number of weeks ago. I'm, I'm sure it already has been. Um, it's, it's not my remit directly to to undertake those discussions with the retail sector. But I'll, as I say, I'll feed that back to DfE colleagues um, and and just make sure that it is definitely on there. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, and thanks, Liz. Going then to Paula Bradshaw. Uh, could Paula be brought up into the spotlight? And go ahead, please, Paula. Um, thank you very much. Um, um, thank you for your presentation. Pam very much covered a lot of the concerns I have had around supermarkets and the crowding in them, so I won't repeat those. I suppose the only other aspect of it would be around um, the garden centres and the, and the florists and even just the... Um, the fact that a lot of their, their goods are perishable, if that's the right word, for, for flowers and plants. Um, so just a real, real mention to them, a lot of them are outdoors. Um, and I, I think that it'll be very difficult to have community transmission in that, in that setting. But I just wanted to touch on the wider issue there. And I'm very conscious you mentioned around the variants and um, pressure on our health service. But I think we're about 80 days since Christmas. And... Our young people have been off school. Um, they haven't been at university. They haven't been at their sports clubs. Many of them, who young people who work in retail and hospitality, have been on furlough. And I think the truth is that the young people are meeting. I think they're going to house parties, not just in the Holy Lands that I was going about it, but I think that they are meeting. And I think that it's absolutely understandable that they feel like they're caged animals and they're finding ways of circumventing. Um, and breaching COVID regulations. And I suppose we were all young once, and we can understand that. Um, so is there any work looking at even just the behaviour of young people and way, ways in which we can actually provide them with more opportunities to meet, but provide them with enhanced guidance, you know, around man managing risk, minimising risk 
to allow them to come together safely because it, it's quite startling when you think that in, in sort of 80 days that, they, that the executive are under the impression that they haven't been meeting when I have an 18 and a 21 year old and it's like trying to put a bolt across the door that they don't go out to these parties that their friends are going to. So I suppose it's, it's really just about how we are realistic about what's actually happening in our communities because the, the daily um, cases are showing that, 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 that not everybody's sticking to it. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, thanks for raising that. Um, there is a work stream of the executive task force looking at adherence and it's looking at the behavioural aspects of that. Um, I haven't got familiarity with the details of the work they're doing, but I know they have commissioned work and I'm almost certain they'll be looking at youth at youth behaviour for all the reasons you've laid out. So yeah, there, there definitely is a work stream on that. We're very conscious of it. Okay, thank you. Um, as, as about, I'm not blaming them. I'm just saying, like, if we're going to have to live with this virus, um, we're, we're going to have to manage manage their behaviour, and isn't it about, better to support them with guidance as opposed to um, lump them with fines and, and um, penalty notices? I suppose the other aspect that's been raised with me are around the coffee and the ice cream vans that are in our parks. Obviously, people have very few places to go if they're not shopping, um, and it's really just around the safety of those. And I'm, again, I'm not persecuting um, those people who are trying to earn a living and provide a service, but I, I do um, have heard a number of complaints around the lack of social distancing and concerns for community transmission around those sort of pop-up um, venues. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks for raising that. Yes, I I, I wasn't aware of the um, particular concerns that you've just raised around those uh, places, but th that would be something for the local authorities to look at, I think, if it's, uh, if it's a problem. Yeah, so we'll just relay that back. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is that you, Paula? Yeah. Yes, sure. Okay, I'm going then to Carol and yeah, thanks, Paula. Going to Carol Neekillen then, so could I ask Broadcasting to bring Carol up into the spotlight, and please go ahead, Carol. Carol, you're muted. Carol, we're not hearing you there at the moment. Sorry, can Carol, you hear me? We're, we're not able to hear you. Okay, sorry. Yeah, hearing, you, hearing you now. Okay, Liz, it was just in relation to the role of local government in terms of, you know, health and safety of customers. You know what role like for example the health environmental teams would have at the councils um and the other thing i i, I think this is about um the third time that we've raised this with the minister um we're get, so for example your position in relation to retail has been informed by uh the department for the economy okay but yet when we were talking to um, the health minister around, for example, young people. The education authority were very clear that they were adhering to health guidance. So perhaps you could clarify in which sequence all this comes, because my understanding is we all agree to the health guidance. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, the department needs to make a decision based on what they get from other departments. I just want to know if that's the case. Right. Uh, the, the Department of Health provides uh, the health advice, but these decisions are decisions of the executive. So I, I'm not, so the, the health advice comes before the decision of the executive to make changes to the regulations. I'm not sure if that is what you're looking for. Um, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm aware of that. Uh, what I think isn't clear, so let, let me just be completely clear if I can. So, for example, in your response to Pam earlier, you said that you were talking to colleagues from the Department for the Economy in relation to measuring children's feet in terms of retail, the click and collect, okay? So is it a case that you get their advice, you bring it to the Department of Health, and then Minister brings it to the rest of the executive colleagues? because it seems slightly confused if that's what the approach is taken with one department. But yet and all, if you talk to the Department of Education, particularly the Education Authority, youth workers, diversionary youth workers could not, absolutely not meet young people who were vulnerable 
if it was more than one on the ground because they said of the health advice that they got from the minister. So that's what I need clarified, please. The the proposals, I'll just stick with the retail one because I, I'm more familiar with that. The, the proposals on retail were brought by the Department for the Economy, but officials across government departments work collaboratively together to inform each other's policy development. That's joined up government, which we, we strive to achieve. Um, ultimately, the it, ultimately the executive makes the decisions about these things. Health advice is clear at the time that those decisions are considered and taken. Um, but <laughs> I mean, certainly sometimes because of the way we are leading on these regulations in health, but the regulations cut across all departments, we end up reflecting um, to the executive on the totality of things. But essentially, in, de in the Department of Health, we provide health advice and we lead on making the regulations because of the way the legislation is structured. These regulations sit with us. but. That the changes we are making to the regulations are based on the decisions of the whole executive together collectively. They're not unilateral decisions by the Department of Health. Um, guidance is, is additional to that in many cases because we are not only relying on regulation to uh, tackle this pandemic. There's also guidance out there that is not directly um, embedded in regulation in any way at all, in fact. Um, and sometimes departments that are creating guidance will take advice from us on parts of that guidance, but they will be leading on the guidance. They might ask for our particular health input. And of course, there's general lines about the public health approach to this. But general public health guidance is often reflected in, uh, in a wide range of um, departmental guidance that we don't directly write or um, ha have input into, but that general public health guidance is there for all to draw upon. So again, I'm not really sure if I've been able to answer the core of your question there, because I'm, I'm just struggling a little bit with the concern. Does, does that help at all? The concern is, Liz, no, I appreciate you trying to um... You're, you're obviously doing your best. The concern is that we have hundreds of young people who, um, for example, yesterday evening, despite everything else, most young people do adhere to the health guidance. But we have hundreds of young people who are engaged in youth diversionary services and their youth diversionary workers are telling us that they are not allowed under legislation from the Department of Health to engage with more than one, possibly two vulnerable young people um, because of health regulations. So it's just so you can bring that back. That's what we've been told. And the Education Authority have said that as well. Okay. Right. That's actually really helpful. That's very helpful. I think I can see where you're coming from now. And I probably really need to go to the part of the regulation that says that the gatherings limits don't apply where there's a where there's a an issue of health or welfare i haven't got the exact words in front of me but it, it definitely if there's an issue around somebody's health well-being their safety then then that's an exception in the regulations no so we they, they understand that Liz. they do Right. Of course. So, yeah. but the idea is, if you're dealing with, if it's any more than one person or two people, then you're in breach of the regulations, and they're saying that's not sustainable for the mental health of young people. So, uh, perhaps if we could get more information on that, and then what relationship, if any, do local government, particularly through health and environmental, have in relation to retail, um, around health and safety? I mean, I have to say. The supermarkets uh, have done exceptionally well, but I, I I've walked out of I've walked out of them twice because of the numbers. I haven't felt safe going in, 
And I think uh, particularly it's on fire on smaller businesses. When the same goods have been sold at supermarkets and small businesses have been closed and, and can't, um, you know, can't open their businesses because of health restrictions, but the same goods are sold in big supermarkets. There's, a, there's an injustice there. Okay, thank thank you, Carol, and uh, thank you, Liz, for that presentation, for dealing with those answers, and for committing to bring back a number of issues that the committee have raised. I think that's a very useful, a very useful approach, and and I do think that sort of demonstrates the value that we can add in terms of a uh, uh, to and fro conversation in relation to that. So thank you very much. I'm not seeing any other indications from members, Liz, so I think we can allow you to drop off and we will continue with our formal consideration of this SR. Thank you for your time today. Okay, okay. Liz. Thank you. Bye now. Okay, okay members. Um, thank you. I, I think I think I just do want to note, I think the original, the initial presentation there was very good and that it set out the type of issues that are being considered, the type of the type of rationale that was being applied to the SR, and I think that was that was actually very very useful, uh, as, as was as was the commitment to take issues raised and have a look at them. I think that's that's what we would be hoping for in relation to our impact and scrutiny and ad, advice role in relation to all of this. Any other any other issues that members wish to raise at this point before we look at the more formal consideration? Chair. No. Yes, Pam. Yeah, it's just to say, I mean, I think that you're right. I think it was, was a great presentation from Liz and it was good to get that overview. But it just, it kind of does, it's pretty frustrating that when you've raised something with the minister a matter of weeks previously and he seemed to take that on board, you'd expected that to have been put into the system somewhere, even as a thought or an idea. And that obviously hasn't happened in terms of children's shoes. And it just seems to me that there's so much concentration in you know, keeping people apart, that there's, there's no, there doesn't seem to be any kind of forward thinking about, well, how, how can we do this and how can we do it in a structured way that is safe and is better than crowded supermarkets? And that seems to be completely ignored, that reality that you're pushing everybody to the same places as opposed to spreading them out. It just doesn't make any sense to me as time goes on. I, like, you know, I do understand, but I don't know where we go from there. I, I wonder maybe should we as a committee, could we agree to, to write to the minister and, and ask him around those specific areas that, that we're really concerned about? Because I just think it's really, really important that the children have decent footwear. I think it's really damaging to wear. And, and you're talking about very, very long periods of time where they've had to do without. Um, and I'm yeah. sure... It, yeah, you know, I, and I know... Sorry, go ahead. I know what you mean. I've, I've young, I've young children that age myself, and they do, they do shoot up very, very quickly. In fairness, just I think Liz was trying to say that she wasn't saying that it's certainly that it hasn't been raised or discussed yet, but that she would ensure she would check that it has and ensure that if it hasn't, it would be. So in that sense, it may be ongoing. But I would be quite content, and I'll check with other members that we write to check to ensure that it is and to reflect our concern around that issue that that that, that would be looked at very very in a very timely way but also also in the hope that it already is being and i think that was what liz was trying to say she couldn't answer for sure what she will ensure following this meeting she'll follow up on it paula was yeah. in there thank you chair uh, if we're putting a letter in could we ask for an update on that work that um, liz had mentioned around looking at sort of the psychology around young people and behavior to see what um, they're going to be doing around managing that group coming through this pandemic thank you yeah yeah because and i think that was a valid and a useful point as well paula because as well as the concept of harm elimination you also see often harm reduction and you know within within doing your best to eliminate the harm that that you also recognize that there may be times where a harm reduction or a minimization of harms is also valid in support of that so i think that is something if members are content i think that would be useful content carol are you looking in no, yeah, I'm go ahead. I also, but I would also like my um, query raised as well, because I've raised this, like Pam, with the minister who's agreed, and then you don't see anything other than like a nodding head in the assembly. So I'm not saying Pam said that I'm saying that, but um, I think if we can include that in the letter, it will be helpful. Okay, members content with that element being, being included as well? Okay. 
Okay, members, thank, thank you for that. Uh, we now formally consider the SR, and I can advise that it has been subject, it is the subject of confirmatory resolution, and that today is the last opportunity for us to consider it before the Assembly debate on Tuesday, 23rd of March. The examiner has confirmed that she has no comments to make in relation to this rule, uh, and uh, members have raised a number of issues which we are going to reflect to the department. So in, in that context, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 46, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions number two, Amendment number five, Regulations 2021, and recommends it be confirmed. Are we agreed? Agreed. Yep. Agreed. And can I just check, Clark, that you are content that, that you have the sufficient detail there in relation to the issues raised by the committee for reflecting on to the department? And for yes, sir. Asking yes, sir. The department for a response. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Man. Okay, members. Thank you, members. Um, moving on then to correspondence, and I will remind members that we will, as usual, lose broadcasting at 1.30, and we have another closed session to to take into account. So I just ask members to bear that in mind as we go through correspondence and try to move through it as efficiently as we can. So I refer members to papers of tab eight of your pack. And there's a couple of items that I want to uh, draw out to for members' attention. And then I'll, I'll take issues from members as they wish to raise. Items 8.2 and 8.3 in your main pack there, members, uh, in the table pack refer to uh, SR, sorry, those and, and, and tab eight in the in the table pack refer to SR twenty twenty one forward slash eight and the mental health amendment order. This is the one that I touched on earlier with with Siobhan O'Neill. The response in the table pack provides an update on the current pressures of mental health services. The responses also advise the minister has decided now to reverse the amendments relating to second opinions, which will reset mental health legislation to a pre COVID position. The response highlights, therefore, that this will be the last regular update on COVID-19 specific pressures on mental health services. And I want to say I want to acknowledge to the department that I think I think we would generally welcome the fact they had committed during the briefing session around this, that they would revoke or remove those as soon as it was practicable. And I think I want to very much welcome the fact that that has been done. It is a key area of concern around civil liberties and the balance of the balance of rights and the balance of responsibilities and all of that. But I welcome the fact the department have moved reasonably swiftly to to undo those when they could. So, any other comments from members in relation to that, or are members content to note? Content to note, members. Thank you. Item eight point six is a departmental response to issues raised by the committee at the briefing on the COVID nineteen cross departmental vulnerable children and young people's plans. Um, do members have any comments to make in relation to that response? And I can, I can just for information remind members that we have agreed an informal session with the Children's Law Centre and VoIPIC, and that session has now been arranged for Wednesday the 24th of March at 11am via MS Teams. So I think that will be a useful opportunity for the committee to take the temperature of how that's all, all uh, being implemented and rolling out. Uh, are members content to note for now that correspondence? Content. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? A comment is this on is that on that particular one, Paula, or an additional member item of correspondence? No, no on that item, Chair. Go ahead, Paula. Yeah, go ahead, please. No, sorry, I was saying I was content with that on the last item, Chair. Okay, thank you. So, have members any other comments or proposals on any of the other items of correspondence before us today? No. So therefore, can I ask members that you're otherwise content with the actions proposed in the correspondence memo? Are you content? Thank you, members. And moving on then to table correspondence, there are no further items of correspondence in the table pack that I wish to draw members' attention to. So um, forward work program then, I refer you there, members, to the forward work program, which is tab 9.1 of the pack. Are members content to note the forward work program? Yeah, thank you, members. And uh, any other business then, members? No, well, therefore, the, I will just go move to the date, time, and place of our next meeting. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, 25th of March at 9.30 a.m. via video link. 
and we will now uh, ask broadcasting to cease broadcasting and we move into our closed session. Assembly. Senate Chamber.